9. Пошука начинается. Я не знаю, у меня тут только будут вопросы от участников на экране. Больше я... Алло. Доброго дня, шановні мої спікери сьогоднішні. Мене звати Галина Чижик. Доброго дня, спікери. Я Галина Чижик. Я експерт Центру ФЛ «Комбатінг корупцію» і я маю вірю почати ще діалог з часу конференції на дорогу до Вільнюсу, яка продовжується resuscitation package of reforms. So I think the most important reform that must be conducted in Ukraine is the uh, judicial reform. And I'd like to introduce to you the speakers that we are going to uh, discuss it with. And we have Andrei Kostin, who is uh, a member of parliament, head of the parliamentary committee for a legal policy. Next to him is Alexander Banchuk, who is a deputy minister of justice of Ukraine. And uh, Roman Kubida is the uh, deputy chairman of the board of the Center for Political and Legal Reforms and uh, also is the head of uh, the Public Integrity Council. Among the participants of this um, discussion, we have Valentina Danishevska, who is the head of the Supreme Court of Ukraine. She is with us online. Hello, Ms. Valentina. And uh, Mikhail Zhernakov is the um, uh, chairman of the board of the de jure foundation and a uh, member of the uh, public integrity council before we start this uh, 
discussion, let me make some comments on where we are at uh, in terms of the judicial reform, because uh, oftentimes they say that uh, the judicial reform takes place uh, in Ukraine all the time. The new president comes in, the new parliament comes in, and some laws are passed. But for some reason, we can't see quality changes in the judi judicial reform. A few days ago, I uh, checked um, uh, the Razumkov Center uh, poll, um, uh, uh, and um, the results are that only 2.2 percent of Ukrainian citizens trust uh, percent trust um, Ukrainian courts, which is the lowest um, trust level. Uh, almost every day, uh, some uh, uh, voluntary. Uh, um, court orders um, uh, are issued. Um, in the summer, the parliamentary election uh, took place. One of the first parliamentary uh, initiatives of the president of the parliament was the draft law on the reform of the uh, judiciary. It was um, uh, made effective in November, and um, he proposed uh, efficient, uh, active steps that would help us cleanse uh, the judiciary. Uh, but uh, even though the law was made effective, it did not work because uh, uh, first uh, the High yeah, Council of uh, Justice uh, um, was uh, started to sabotage them. And then eventually in June, the president came out with a new initiative with the draft uh, law 3711, um, with which he decided to uh, reboot the High Qualification Commission of Judges for the second time, and this job law is now being um, uh, considered by Parliament, but it's been almost two years uh, since uh, the political uh, uh, power has uh, been replaced in Ukraine, and uh, they were going to reform the judiciary. It's been two years, and we can't see any changes in this country. So, that's where we are uh, now. Uh, so prior to um, uh, asking the first question to the speaker, I'd like to say that we will be working till 10.15. Each of the speakers has five minutes uh, for a talk, and then we'll have, um, and then we'll have two minutes uh, to um, reply to the questions. And then we encourage everyone who is online, who is uh, in Zoom, to ask questions in chat to our speakers, and we'll be able to then discuss them. After I, as a moderator, use my um, uh, power and uh, uh, ask my questions to the speakers. So I'd like to put the first question to Ruman Kubida, who is an expert of the Political and Legal Reform Center, who has prepared uh, an analytical survey. Uh, uh, as he prepared for the um, conference um, um, on the uh, Ukrainian reforms, which should uh, take place uh, hopefully in uh, Vilnius, in the capital uh, of um, Lithuania. Uh, in that uh, presentation, you have pro proposed uh, steps that Ukraine should take, uh, not just to correct the current problems, but to improve the situation and eventually to give the Ukrainians what they want, the fair court. So what are your proposals? And how can we uh, succeed in the judicial reform? Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we can uh, briefly summarize uh, last year. Uh, unfortunately, in terms of the judicial uh, reform of the judiciary, and all of the speakers have mentioned that uh, at the opening of the conference, I think it's a year of lost or non um, realized or non implemented uh, opportunities, or it has a minus sign because after. Uh, the powers of the higher qualification commission of judges uh, were. Uh, uh, suspended. We don't have it. We don't have even have the law that would uh, uh, enable us to form uh, the commission. Moreover, the polit political commitment about the reboot of the higher um, uh, council of uh, 
uh, justice has uh, not been uh, uh, met and um, even uh, the new uh, co composition of the uh, of the council under um, um, has um, uh, not um, uh, been uh, um, uh, met so i think it's a, a false a path that is going to lead to the preservation uh, uh, maintenance of these corruption practices in the courts i would like to add that the constitutional court unfortunately has added uh, uh, to uh, the formation of the system of impunity in the judiciary by abolish by uh, uh, abolishing a lot of uh, uh, articles in the criminal code uh, where uh, they have um, abolished the criminal uh, liability for ill gotten gains uh, illegal enrichment um, also there is no more liability uh, for uh, um, approving non-constitutional decisions so we still have some time till the uh, 14th of uh, till the 11th of December and uh, uh, if the parliament doesn't uh, make uh, a decision and uh, that law it is not made effective uh, that will continue to be the problem so the judges have an incentive to approve uh, uh, such arbitrary decisions uh, i was surprised uh, as i uh, uh, saw one of the appellate court uh, uh, orders uh, where they completely abolished uh, criminal liability for any corruption um, you know, offenses um, uh, any corruption crimes and administrative offenses that the decision uh, of uh, the uh, uh, co uh, constitutional court that will mean that uh, that is that means the full impunity of uh, the judges will be in place that's a big problem also the decision to abolish the liability for uh, lying in uh, the uh, tax uh, uh, or income in declarations uh, income statements that's uh, a big problem as well so this year we have uh, uh, stricken the anti-corruption measures that uh, had been taken previously uh, in the, the previous five years. So that's a big step back. What shall we do? Of course, uh, along the line, we have to solve uh, the problem of the Higher Qualification Commission and the Higher, the higher uh, Council of Justice by forming an independent commission. Uh, we have to verify, we have to check uh, the active members of the Higher Council uh, of Justice to clean it from uh, those who tolerate and support uh, various corruption practices in the court system, uh, those who, um, uh, who uh, uh, allow uh, the uh, judges uh, who didn't uh, pass uh, the qualification tests to resign and uh, also competition procedures must be introduced uh, using an independent commission uh, the, the higher qualification commission of the higher um, uh, council of justice and the step that would reinforce the higher council of justice in forming these bodies these agencies uh, according to the uh, Venice Commission, that is going to be a big mistake, and I would agree with this. Uh, in the composition of such an independent commission that could uh, um, uh, conduct a, a, a prior selection, could uh, include independent experts who have uh, demonstrated uh, their important role, uh, uh, um, and it would also be good to uh, engage the representatives of the public uh, to uh, uh, enable a better trust of the process. There are some positive preparatory steps uh, also. Uh, uh, the approval of uh, the anti-corruption strategy in the first uh, hearing, uh, the uh, government submitted uh, uh, to the parliament the anti-corruption strategy. It's important that it should not uh, stay in paper because a lot of steps already have to be made before the anti-corruption strategy is uh, uh, approved. Another positive trend is that uh, we have been insisting on the introduction of a classical um, uh, uh, 
court of uh, jury uh, and um, uh, that was also submitted to the parliament and and we can support this um, the ideas that uh, are in the lectures of the economic development uh, and I, I would agree that the uh, issue of the court reform is about our welfare uh, because the economy is not going to develop without a, a fair judiciary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roman, especially for um, staying within the five minute frame. Uh, we can, I guess, discuss these proposals later as we have a discussion. Uh, I'd like to put my next question to Mr. Roman, uh, uh, Mr. Andre Kostin, who is the head of the Rada Committee. Now, everybody is looking at you because uh, the any impetus to the changes uh, can be given by Parliament only as they pass uh, uh, a law. And now it's a presidential uh, draft of law number 3711, which several weeks ago was uh, uh, sent by the Rada to be improved without even voting for it in the first reading uh, because um, the text of this draft requires um, improvements. Uh, let me uh, remind to you that it's about the reboot of the uh, competition uh, selection uh, of the Higher Qualification Commission of Judges. Um, the Venice um, Commission um, are proposed uh, uh, options on how we could improve this draft uh, to uh, meet the European standards and the European realities. Uh, last year, when uh, the previous uh, uh, draft of Zelensky was uh, heard in Parliament, it was uh, uh, critically uh, assessed by uh, uh, Europe, by uh, the European Union, and then um, uh, in the, on those po points which weren't heard, especially the points on the Supreme Court, they then uh, rejected to participate in the implementation of the law and did not nominate any experts to the um, expert commission. It seems to me that uh, in the parliament there is another chance to establish a constructive cooperation both with the civil society and the international part, uh, community with uh, the international partners because this draft um, bill envisages uh, their role there. So the entire society in Ukraine and in the world um, uh, is uh, supposed to, to adapt to the new realities uh, which we have because of the pandemic. We are all working online, but are you prepared, Mr. Andre, to undertake this responsibility to become a bridge between the international, uh, the international MPs, the experts of the civil society, our international partners, to ensure the openness, the transparency of the process uh, of uh, uh, this um, uh, um, of the improvement of this uh, draft, and to engage all the experts to the discussion. It's very important for the judicial system and for the country and for this draft law. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the situation with COVID uh, is making the adjustments uh, to the pace of cooperation and the pace of uh, uh, working on the ideas uh, and the draft laws. But we have, I guess, adapted to this and are using all the means of uh, modern communication to solve these problems. For instance, let me give you uh, an example. Uh, the, uh, the last uh, uh, committee meeting, uh, an offline meeting took place on the 2nd of September. So all the other meetings took place online. So we have a lot of such meetings. Um, um, and at any rate, we're not going to lose the pace and we'll keep working. And uh, uh, another example uh, of uh, a very responsible approach of the members of the committee to their mission. Uh, we had meetings of the committees where our colleagues who uh, uh, were um, COVID um, 
um, diagnosed uh, positively, they t still participated, participated in the meetings. They could, were still working 24-7. Uh, so from the legal perspective, they have the right to. That's um, They're not compelled to, but they have the right to. So it's, it's a matter of their approach. The, it's their responsibility. Um, a few steps, a few historical um, steps. So f uh, first of all, uh, the uh, 1008 uh, draft um, was uh, submitted by the president uh, uh, in the very beginning of the Rada cadence, which uh, took place about more than a year ago. And the uh, uh, adoption of this uh, uh, draft law um, uh, 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 was taking place as part of a very lively discussion and there were a lot of comments, but the political will of the Ukrainian president uh, changed the approach to the formation of the High Qualification Commission of Judges and that openness to the civil society, the openness to the Ukrainian society, the open uh, uh, attitude to our international partners, which at the time was different from the um, um, practices of the Institutes of the uh, Council of Europe and the Venice Commission, um, which had supported the previous judicial reform and the formation of the High Qualification Commission of Judges at the uh, a professional quota principle, well, it was still the position of the president. And even though the draft was criticized and despite uh, the resolution of the Venice uh, uh, Commission, despite uh, the decision of the Constitutional Court uh, on this draft, the president remained with the uh, position that the selection uh, of the members uh, to uh, the High Qualification Commission of Judges should take place uh, engaging uh, the international partners. That's a very important principal position of the president. And to the resumption of justice and the resumption of the uh, sense of justice by the citizens of Ukraine, uh, the uh, and the trust uh, to the judicial um, uh, to, to the judiciary is one of the goals uh, for President Volodymyr Zelensky. So as we as uh, left this uh, provision, and I'd like to add here that in the composition, which is envisaged in the 37-11 draft, there is no fixed quota for the judges in, in the composition of the High Qualification Commission of Judges, which is not today a stable practice in the European countries, um, in EU countries and in the Council of Europe. However, it is a substantial position that the president uh, included in this draft law. Unfortunately, the situation with uh, the adoption of any drafts, uh, uh, draft laws uh, 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 on the uh, judiciary is extremely politicized. It's a historical uh, trend in Ukraine and any proposed reformist uh, idea uh, ev evokes um, a palette um, of uh, controversial ideas and some factions which uh, uh, oppose uh, uh, to any international element in the judiciary, uh, in the uh, judicial branch, um, argue that there are some proposals that we can invite international experts more broadly to form of the uh, um, judicial uh, uh, government. Um, bodies. Uh, so we have the proposals to find a compromise that would not cross uh, these principal lines uh, that the president used in the 3711 draft bill. And this is why in the summer, when uh, we had a break uh, in uh, the Verkhovna Rada uh, work, I, I made a decision which was um, approved by the leadership of the parliament. Uh, uh, to uh, submit the presidential uh, bill uh, to the Venice Commission. We are very grateful to the Venice Commission um, for processing this bill in a very um, prompt uh, uh, way. And they uh, uh, generated their conclusion, which was somewhat different uh, uh, from the previous one, because the balance between the High uh, uh, Qualification Commission of Judges and the Higher um, uh, 
uh, our uh, Council of Justice uh, um, it was based on the previous conclusions of the Venice Commission, uh, which uh, uh, was supporting uh, the uh, um, approximation of powers uh, between uh, the um, former and the latter. So uh, the, I think this issue was used by the Venice Commission as a priority and proposed that at this stage of the development of the Ukrainian legal system, it is preferable to have a greater autonomy of the uh, uh, Greater Qualification and Commission of Judges and proposed to approximate the uh, the great uh, uh, the high qualification commission of judges and the high uh, council of justice um, so the venice commission uh, we are grateful to the venice commission and to the council of europe uh, for the unique meeting that we had uh, after the conclusion uh, um, of the venice commission was drafted so the committee uh, before submitting this draft uh, to the uh, uh, to the conference uh, room, we made a conclusion that all the recommendations of the Venice Commission will be used uh, uh, as amendments between the first and second reading. However, uh, uh, for the Parliament, it's not just a, about a political will, it's also about the COVID situation. The Parliament did not support uh, uh, this model, and the draft uh, is now being improved. The work meetings are taking uh, place at the uh, committee. I proposed to, to the members of parliament um, to do this, uh, to decide with some um, uh, principal uh, uh, provisions. Uh, we had uh, a meeting of the subcommittee on justice, which recommended to the committee um, as they prepare a new draft based on the presidential uh, draft to be limited uh, to the points in the draft which is the resumption uh, of the work of the Higher Qualification Commission of Judges. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the issue of the, the uh, uh, High Court of uh, Ukraine. Um, I, can, can, I uh, mentioned to all the members of the committee that as soon as we prepare some draft uh, for a discussion, uh, uh, we will be discussing it in a very broad way. We will invite uh, the representatives of the judiciary. We will invite the uh, uh, the civil uh, society. Our communication with the international partners is very productive, and I've al al already received support from the international uh, projects, from uh, the international partners, in the way that they are prepared to assist in drafting this draft. Uh, in preparing this draft uh, law and we'll be cooperating and the support is very important for us. With regards to the uh, next steps, I think I'm beyond um, the time frame, but um, with uh, regards to the next steps, we are uh, um, experiencing, uh, uh, we are in the time uh, where we have to imp improve uh, the higher uh, um, the work of the higher uh, council of justice. I am very cautious with the word reforms here, not because um, I don't want any changes to take place, but I, I want you to understand that the, the word reform uh, in our Ukrainian realities, um, if we apply it to the uh, judicial system, in my opinion, it can be someone um, discredited. So I, we understand that the system works. It needs improvements in certain things. And we also are holding a professional dialogue uh, um, on the discussion of issues to ensure the unity and sustainability uh, of the practice of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's important for the uh, uh, judicial uh, practice to be sustainable, predictable, um, so that uh, different courts would not uh, uh, issue different court orders between the first and the second instances. Um, and also, I'm very cautious with uh, any trust uh, uh, ratings uh, to any power, because oftentimes it's not uh, the court as a, a legal entity that makes a decision. That decision is made or oh, that court, uh, uh, that order is uh, is issued by the uh, judge or the um, the uh, 
uh, the board um, uh, of churches. So unfortunately, uh, there are some orders, there are some decisions that um, are not liked because uh, there is no uh, legal ground behind them. Or something must have happened that provoked to uh, to to issue such uh, unusual, to put it mildly, orders. And what's important at this stage is that the, the president of Ukraine uh, understands the situation with the need to um, uh, renew uh, uh, justice in the, the court system. He understands uh, all these uh, situations. He, he uh, rebooted uh, the uh, composition uh, uh, of the Reform Commission, which is a, a platform to provide advice to the President of the Parliament in, in terms of passing certain uh, bills. And uh, that's an important first step uh, for the Working Group on Justice. And we see that the uh, President has uh, proposed a, a strategy to um, develop, develop further the judicial uh, system. That is going to be the work plan for everybody. That is going to uh, be our guideline. That will be clear for our international partners, for the businesses, to know where we're going and when we're going to achieve the goals. So I believe that uh, the ongoing dialogue and cooperation and, and uh, exchanging ideas with the professional community and the political forces and the civil society and the international partners is very important. You're right. Sometimes we need some time to reach a mutual understanding, but the dialogue is open and an open dialogue is always better than making decisions which will then not be supported and which will not be considered legitimate, such as the decision of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, which we cannot uh, trust from a professional uh, perspective. I would like to agree with you completely. Uh, the lack of trust uh, um, by the society emerges uh, where a decision is made behind the closed doors. Um, I, along with Roman and Mikhailo, are ready to join in any discussions of the draft laws. I will also be happy to take part in drafting some documents. Uh, but uh, for that uh, purpose, we need your help in, in engaging us to the process, in the process. I must warn the participants because the parliament is uh, is working hard you may have to leave this uh, discussion earlier so i uh, allowed uh, um, myself to give you some more time for the for, for, for your talks i'd like to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Ms. valentina danishevska who is uh, the uh, chair um, of the supreme court in one of your interviews you mentioned that the president uh, when uh, he proposed um, uh, the amendments uh, uh, to uh, the parliament on uh, the Supreme Court. He uh, had time to uh, meet with uh, Tom Cruise, but he didn't have time for the uh, chairs, chair uh, of the Supreme Court. In June, uh, the president uh, proposed a new initiative to the parliament and in the, his new draft, uh, the Supreme Court is mentioned again. So my question to you is over this year, did the president find time to meet with you, to talk with you, to hear your position, uh, to hear the position of the Supreme Court and the, uh, uh, the president of the, the, the Supreme Court in terms of its reformation and uh, in terms of the reform of the in judiciary? Uh, and what do you think about the proposals to uh, hand over some important business uh, with regards uh, um, uh, to the reform uh, of the judiciary? Uh, to be considered by the Supreme Court, uh, such as a reform of the Higher Qualification Commission of Judges and Higher Council of uh, um, um, uh, Justice, uh, uh, according to the uh, conclusions of the Venice uh, uh, Commission, in light of the current events in Ukraine. Uh, 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 just like the Supreme Court um, uh, plenary session uh, identified the criminal activities of the judges of the uh, county course. So, Ms. Valentina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Kalina. Welcome to all the speakers. 
Also, welcome to all those who are online joining our event. I'm also very thankful to the organizations and to the board of the RPR for uh, organizing such a expert marathon to evaluate the reforms which uh, are ongoing in Ukraine. I believe that this discussion and uh, the speeches of uh, such renowned speakers, I had the chance to listen to some speakers and also I read uh, some presentations and I'm really happy that we are speaking friendly and searching ways to improve our life, to improve, uh, for, in fact, for changes which are awaited by the society. Uh, it's a bit funny that for such a long period of time, uh, my interview is uh, being quoted. Uh, I was uh, not uh, jealous to Tom Cruise uh, and not angry with the president, but I'm thankful to the journalist who was asking this interview because uh, due to this heading, uh, he managed to attract attention uh, to this question. At uh, that uh, time and even till now, uh, there was uh, no direct uh, communication between the Supreme Court, myself and the president but we have the communication with the office of the president, with the committee on the legal policy. And I believe that this discussion appeared uh, maybe later than it should have appeared, but we are reaching some outcomes. Maybe it's not that much measurable right now or visible, but I believe uh, that uh, focusing attention on such issues as uh, establishment of forming uh, uh, the uh, members of the um, High Qualification Commission to achieve the goals which we have been set. First of all, I would like to mention for the judicial system, as well as for the society, the common goal is to have a fair, transparent, uh, independent justice to which the citizens trust. And uh, achieving this goal, we shouldn't be focused only on reloading, because the reloading has happened already in a way, and we can see successes from this, but we also notice that if there are conditions for the independent justice are not created, then no rebooting, no reloading will have success. So in parallel, as we are reviewing the, the philosophy of uh, recruiting the employees uh, and the judges to the uh, judiciary system, we should speak more about the conditions for a fair, independent, integral professional can stay like this for all the time he or she is uh, working in the judicial system. It's a very important issue. The working conditions of the judges are the main focus for the European partners who have high results in the level of trust to the courts and judges. And in this way, they uh, provide better um, circumstances for fair justice. 
I would like to pay attention that the conditions in which uh, the judicial, judicial system is functioning are not those which um, uh, are assisting uh, in achieving uh, our common goal. The judicial system is unstable because because there is no strategy or a specified detailed plan or the awaited uh, changes. And when the judges are under stress and we cannot wait for a calm justice when the judges are uh, under stress because the judges uh, are in fact nervous about their destiny and they cannot be uh, such uh, examples and we are as we are willing as for now the judiciary system feels the intrusion uh, from the part of the financial support we do not have enough funds to guarantee <clears throat> and the legal norms for the citizens. If we look at the functioning of the high anti-corruption court, the selection to which is an example which uh, we are asking to follow, and in C reform of 2016 um and we believe that it's a success story. This court was functioning for one year. Who is guaranteeing the independence of those uh, justices? In the register, we have dozens of claims against those uh, justices. Isn't it an intrusion in the, their functioning? So how can we guarantee the fair trial, especially in such a complicated uh, sector as the proceedings uh, in the corruption cases? We have been working a lot Uh, to manage in a positive way the topic of trust. So people should feel positive changes which are happening in the judiciary system. Uh, Mrs. Helena, I wouldn't agree uh, in full when you were saying that the level of trust according to the last uh, polls are is uh, 2%. Uh, I believe that the evaluation uh, system, which is used by those researchers, says about different things. You named the number about uh, people who have full trust. There is also a provision uh, rather trust. Uh, than not. So we are looking very thoroughly into uh, those researches. We uh, look very deep into detail uh, into those uh, researches to understand where we should strengthen our work, our influence, our communications maybe, in order to change the perception of people about the work of the judiciary system. According to our assessments, we see uh, that at the beginning of the reform in 2017, the level of trust was around 7%. And now, according to our assessment of the same research, we see that in general, more than 13% trust uh, to uh, the judiciary system. And that means that this indicator uh, grew twice. And uh, for the courts, local and the Supreme Court, 
and uh, the number is even high, uh, almost 19%. From this research, we made a conclusion that the level two the uh, course is uh, almost uh, the same as uh, to uh, the uh, anti-corruption court, to the uh, parliament. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, the people do not trust not uh, to the uh, court only, but uh, to the power, um, to the institutions, the state institutions in general. Uh, thus, the state uh, should think about how to grow this trust uh, to the state institutions in general and uh, that our common efforts would uh, bring more results uh, than uh, those dispersed uh, efforts so the level of trust to the court uh, was uh, in fact uh, decreasing for decades and uh, in the last four years, uh, it grew twice. Um, it's a good sign. I'm not saying that uh, it's uh, the best result, but it means that what uh, we have been doing for those years brought some results. So it means that we are doing something constructive in this way, and we uh, should uh, highlight, underline what are those aspects which uh, um, makes uh, this growth possible. And I, I would like to remind you about the time, then uh, I will finish. I would like uh, your pay attention that the courts are reviewing annually 4 million claims. Four millions and we uh, hear your criticism that of course we see that there are cases when the rulings uh, are not fair we should also calculate the percentage of those rulings in comparing to 4 million claims. I believe that all those unfair uh, rulings influence the system in a much higher way than hundreds uh, of positive rulings. But as we gathered here, not uh, just common people, but the experts, we should understand that those that uh, speaking in those words, um, uh, we are also undermining uh, the professionalism of uh, the judges who have had uh, very good rulings uh, and who had worked with those 4 million cases. So if we will not have people who are willing uh, to support uh, our system, we could achieve the outcome only in uh, the case when in the judiciary system we have uh, people who, who are willing to work and to show good results. So uh, as soon as we increase the result of those professionals, uh, then the number of those of, of those with whom we should not work will decrease. So let's uh, fight with uh, this um, aspect. Uh, on my part, I will say that, for example, the decision, the ruling of the Pechersk uh, uh, court uh, the, uh, uh, about the $10 million uh, to uh, give them back to the investors of the uh, private one. I would like to answer to this. Yes, it's a very bad case. Where is your attention to the fact that the Supreme Court stopped this ruling? Where uh, you should pay attention to this. I'm not commenting uh, the Supreme Court ruling. 
but that's uh, the point that uh, is uh, no, not in this only one ruling of the Pechersk uh, court, but the uh, High Council of Justice, uh, which should have reacted uh, to this ruling, uh, just uh, didn't have, uh, didn't take any actions. I agree with you that the efforts uh, should be joined <clears throat> and uh, to fight for good, uh, professional and fair judges. And we would like uh, to see the judges who are inside the system and who are also fighting uh, for transparent and uh, fair system. And uh, the uh, Supreme uh, uh, Court uh, ruling was very positively perceived by the uh, uh, society. And uh, one of the very notorious uh, courts, uh, the uh, ruling of the Supreme Court uh, was very critical about those facts. And as a society, we uh, are waiting uh, that uh, the judicial system will act as the Supreme uh, Court. And uh, you are quite right that we should work not only on the uh, fact uh, that we uh, should select uh, very good professionals uh, to the judicial system, but also to uh, provide the circumstances for those professionals to stay for a long period uh, in the judicial system. I believe that we will still have time for the comments. I would like to remind to everyone who is watching us in Zoom, you can write your questions uh, in the chat. And the next question will be to Alexander Bonchuk, the Deputy uh, Minister of, of Justice, and he represents the uh, Cabinet of Ministers, and uh, the Cabinet of Ministers is uh, responsible for uh, the uh, judicial reform. So this year, Ukraine signed uh, two agreements, so one uh, with the uh, National um, Monetary Fund, and uh, those institutions will provide uh, us uh, the financial assistance, which is quite needed for us, uh, and it's uh, amounted in uh, billions of dollars and euro, but they're not willing to provide those funds uh, just uh, for nothing. And National Monetary Fund, uh, for the first time in its history, asked for the provision uh, for the changes in the judiciary system, because the international investors understand that when providing funds uh, to Ukraine, uh, they are just sending them to the pockets of oligarchs we can reform the uh, bank uh, system or, or the um, uh, economic system, uh, but uh, then we will come uh, to uh, the judiciary system. Uh, so one of the requests of uh, those two institutions is to change the composition of the High Council of Justice According uh, to the agreement with the International Monetary Fund, uh, the uh, law on the High Council of Justice had to be adopted in October, but uh, it didn't happen. We know that the draft law was uh, designed by the Ministry of Justice, and uh, it suggests that it should be an open competition uh, and not only the uh, judges uh, should be involved in this, but also other legal professionals and international uh, donors. So my question is when this uh, draft law will be submitted to the parliament, why we are violating the conditions with the fund. Thank you. So a small uh, history according to the commitments which Ukraine undertook and uh, in front of the EU and uh, IMF, we uh, are responsible uh, 
and we wanted to show uh, ourselves as responsible partners. That's why from in August we drafted uh, the uh, law, which uh, as foreseen in the written commitments, states that uh, the uh, commission should be established, an expert commission, and uh, there will be a proportional representative uh, from the Council of Judges, uh, from our international partners, also three members. And what is important, uh, why the representatives uh, of the Council of Judges uh, were also present. And it's very important uh, for the judges uh, to have the feeling uh, that they influence the selection uh, of the composition of the Council of Justice. For the international uh, partners, it's important also to have their representation. And it will mean both for the international organizations that uh, their position is present, but also uh, it will be important for the international investors that this process uh, can be trusted and what we mentioned at the beginning that invest investors will react uh, to uh, the uh, fact uh, how the international partners are represented uh, in uh, the uh, selection commissions and in this draft law, there is another aspect that uh, the last uh, three uh, representatives in this expert commission uh, should uh, be delegated uh, by uh, the uh, Integrity Council. Because we believe that it's not uh, enough uh, to give give all the powers uh, to the representatives uh, of the judiciary system and international partners. Uh, we believe uh, that the representatives of the NGOs and civil society will be very proactive and they are capable uh, to perform those functions. They are ready to provide the transparency and efficiency of those procedures. That's why in this legislation, we added uh, the provision uh, that uh, this uh, commission will include also the representatives of the Integrity Council. This draft law also foresees uh, that this expert commission, the commission on, uh, on the selection of candidates uh, will uh, be conducting a separate competition uh, for uh, the uh, position in uh, the uh, High Council of Justice. And also the transitional provisions foresee that this expert commission will be an independent one. It will not be a commission uh, under uh, the uh, High Council of Justice. It will be an independent body. And uh, the uh, current members of the High Council of Justice should also undergo the integrity check. And uh, the general society got to know about uh, this uh, draft law because uh, there was uh, an opinion uh, published uh, by uh, the uh, High Council of Justice. And we also sent uh, this uh, uh, draft law uh, to the the uh, Office of the Council of Europe to the Office of the EU delegation uh, to uh, uh, all uh, the stakeholders. So we informed all the stakeholders about these initiatives, uh, but uh, it, it became uh, more uh, public uh, after this opinion was uh, published. So I would like to say that uh, uh, myself and the experts uh, do not agree with uh, the critics uh, uh, which was submitted by the consultative opinion of the High Council of Justice. The critics go um, to the fact that those provisions uh, uh, are um, 
undermining uh, the independence uh, uh, of the uh, judiciary bodies. Uh, we think that those uh, uh, critical uh, statements are not grounded and uh, the uh, presence of the international partners does not uh, mean the, that uh, the decision of those international uh, partners will have a consultative uh, uh, way, but uh, still uh, the uh, assemblies of the prosecutors, uh, assemblies of the judges still have the, the right to delegate the candidates. So when we're speaking about the integrity check of the current members, uh, it's also a, a, a recommendation rather than a stated uh, or adopted provision. That's why we believe that there are no violations of the constitution or sovereignty uh, of uh, the state. After we uh, took into consideration uh, the critical aspects which could be uh, uh, taken into account, and now this draft law is uh, waiting for the submission to the cabinet of ministers. So we have the situation with uh, 3711. Uh, we do not know still. Now we do not know technically where to submit it. So it's now the decision of the minister but, and uh, of the government what will be happening with those uh, amendments. Uh, according to the uh, law uh, 3711. So that's why uh, uh, this draft law uh, is uh, just uh, um, has just stopped somewhere. So we are moving according to our logics, either from the op office of the president or from the cabinet ministers. But uh, our position as the minister, we uh, have um, provided in uh, our draft law. And uh, we provided that uh, both the national stakeholders and international stakeholders are included in this process. And from the opinion uh, Sergei Korsin provided, and the Venice uh, Commission uh, also uh, mentioned about the uh, positive provisions of which are included in the draft law of the Ministry of Justice. So certainly we, we can't see any risks of uh, this uh, draft uh, being non-constitutional. However, mm -hmm. such a lengthy procedure and the uncertainty uh, of the 3711 stops the government. Uh, from saying its word in the process and uh, uh, to submit this draft to be considered by the parliament. Because even technically, if 3711 draft uh, go, contains these provisions uh, for the first or the second reading uh, uh, and would reflect certain commitments uh, of Ukraine to EU and the IMF, then there will be no need for our draft of all. So we're on the crossroads. At any rate, uh, in my opinion, what's important is that uh, first we have to, we have re reflected uh, in this draft uh, all the commitments that we have undertaken without any manipulations. And secondly, that uh, we have reported uh, 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 this position to our partners. Uh, we have informed our partners about our position and we understand the, the importance uh, thereof. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, uh, for such a uh, candid uh, position. I am sorry that Andrei Kostin could not stay with us until now, because it is here who could uh, give us uh, some clarity in the situation. But uh, um, our chairman of uh, the board uh, of the Jejura Foundation, Mikhail Zhernakov, could uh, give us uh, some more information. What do you think about the draft or uh, law of the Ministry of Justice that envisages the uh, changes in the procedure of the formation of the higher uh, Council of Justice? Uh, uh, do you think the procedure as uh, prescribed in this draft uh, will help us uh, 
um, renew this uh, agency and where should uh, these provisions uh, uh, be contained? Um, maybe uh, there's a popular idea that first we have to reboot the Higher Qualification Commission of Judges and only then should we uh, discuss uh, uh, the reform of the Higher um, uh, hello, dear colleagues. Thank you uh, for uh, your invitation. I'm um, happy to um, be with, with you virtually. Uh, I am not sure if I can uh, reflect on these uh, ideas within five minutes. Uh, according to uh, the uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, we may uh, have to um, uh, reflect to what has been said. Um, Every time a new reform is implemented in Ukraine, um, uh, we have these problems. As long as we have uh, such a level of trust to the, to the judges, we won't have any other path. Uh, uh, unless we uh, execute this reform, uh, uh, every new power will be trying to uh, do uh, this. It's a permanent uh, status of reforms um, that we are having, and it will continue like this in the future unless we complete uh, the reform. I'm going to uh, mention uh, uh, the draft law of the Ministry of Justice. Uh, Ms. Henry has left, unfortunately, but I'd like to disagree with him, uh, because he said that the system works, the system doesn't work, that's the problem. The system mm, works the way that the constitutional uh, court uh, approves uh, such decisions, uh, and uh, the president mentioned uh, uh, to me, and that the head of the National Security and Defense Council the, uh, um, said that it, it is exactly um, the decisions, these are the decisions that uh, actually support the, the enemies. Um, so the um, uh, judges, uh, uh, it's the system that uh, actually um, uh, persecutes uh, the judges uh, uh, who um, uh, try to um, uh, support whistleblowers. Uh, so the International Monetary Fund has uh, uh, given its uh, assessment uh, of the situation uh, in the memorandum uh, and the Venice Commission. Uh, also did that. Uh, 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 where they said that the, the Higher Council just uh, requires an immediate reform, and the top officials of uh, EU, which we have aspirations for, Ms. Katerina Matrinova at this conference uh, a few days ago said that we have to reboot the judicial reform. I don't know how many more messages, messages do you need to say that the reform... Okay, let's not call it a reform. If it has a negative uh, connotation, the reboot or building reconquista or, or, uh, or the structural uh, rebuilding. Um, so if you permit, uh, I'd like to point to the uh, issues which and need to, to be addressed. Uh, until, uh, the, the, the High Qualification Commission of Judges, whatever good it is, I hope it will be good and better than it was. Unless unless it is renewed uh, in the nearest future, as long as it looks like it, uh, we won't have a judicial reform and we won't have a uh, court of integrity because unfortunately the, uh, this council has uh, demonstrated its approach to the independent judges and to the judicial reform in general by blocking the 193 uh, law implementation. So as long as the Higher Council of Justice uh, uh, makes its uh, decisions, uh, I think that we won't have any judicial reform. Uh, so we do need uh, to remove the uh, provision of uh, um, this uh, um, uh, on the, the High Qualification Commission of Judges and High Council of Justice, uh, uh, according to the Venice Commission, and, uh, and also the memorandum with the IMF, which should have been executed a month ago, 
ну, дуже однозначно сказала клелість міжнародний валютний фонд IMF clearly stated президентом the recent talk with the president by тому щоб прислати місію до rejecting to send a mission to Ukraine and that means means that we'll have a big problem with covering the budgetary deficit and finding money so I think that the this draft потрібно виконати в рамках цього меморандуму в рамках has to be executed as part of this memorandum меморандуму з європейським союзом в рамках меморандуму з європейською уніяною з партією лави яку президента і партії свого народу які вони давали на вибори щодо перезавантаження вищої ради which they had made in terms of the reboot of the high council не буду зупинятися окремо на перезавантаженні власне вищої ради not going to be talking in detail about the reboot of the high council of justice and which way that should be done that is drafted in the memorandum the, the political program just has to be done, has to be done uh, simultaneously with the, the reboot, um, reboot of the higher qualification commission of judges because uh, uh, no, that uh, problem will exist um, as long as uh, the current composition of the higher council of um, uh, justice. The constitutional court, because of the uh, time, I'm not going to dwell on that, but we have to do something about it as well. I think a, a working group must be formed uh, at uh, week four of this crisis. I don't think that this step is, this is decisive enough. We have to do something immediately. We have to, to stop uh, the, uh, the detrimental influence of the Constitutional Court uh, because the Constitutional Court uh, has the right to abolish very important laws. Um, we have to uh, and, and, and they are basically resuming the uh, we have to resume the anti-corruption uh, structure and finally the administrative court of Kiev the petition got uh, the required number of uh, uh, points and votes and uh, also we have to remove the powers uh, which are not pertinent to county court so four things high qualification commission judges and the high council of justice the constitutional court and the administrative county court Рішуче не реформувати і не перезавантажити, як би ми це не називали, всі чотири, то збирається величезна імовірність і величезна загроза того, що якщо навіть буде якийсь поступ, то ми все одно рано чи пізно придемо до статусу КО, придемо до цієї точки, чи як би ми її не називали, в якій ми знаходимося прямо зараз, тому треба діяти і треба діяти досить добре. Uh, thank you, Mikhailo. It's a great plan to uh, renew, reform, reboot four uh, absolutely vital institutions, the Higher Qualification Commission of Judges, the Higher Council of Justice, the Constitutional Court, and the um, uh, Administrative County Court of Kiev. Um, it may sound uh, very hard, but uh, we have evidence today that these uh, bodies are currently under the control of an organized uh, judicial judicial criminal group, which not only threatens our pro-European reforms, but unfortunately it threatens our independence and sovereignty as a state. Um, we still have some time, so I would like to uh, encourage our speakers to make some final conclusions or uh, remarks uh, if you would like to respond to what you've heard from other speakers otherwise i still have a few questions to you so would anyone like to maybe roman you please uh i'd like to make only one statement unfortunately uh, the political power has received uh, an incredible credit of uh, trust uh, and uh, the presidential uh, party and uh, the government um, for more than a, a year. After a year, we see a big fragmentation. There is no political will. Maybe the president is demonstrating it, but the presidential office is in opposition to the president. Um, if we compare uh, uh, the words of the president uh, with uh, the actions of the presidential office, we see uh, an opposition and the same we can see with um, uh, see in the, the faction in the parliament 
in Parliament, which uh, uh, is not uh, coordinated with uh, various interests, and that's a great obstacle um, of, for the implementation, implementation of uh, high quality changes in the uh, justice system. We see the changes in the government. Um, I think they are quite positive if we talk about the system of justice. But again, we see some confrontation with the presidential office and the parliament. Unfortunately, that does not incentivize progress. We have to seriously do something here to consolidate the efforts of everybody for the sake of positive changes in the system of justice. Thank you, Roman. It seems to me that it's exactly what uh, Ms. Valentina Danishevska mentioned, that we have to consolidate the efforts to uh, for these uh, positive changes in the uh, judicial system to take place. Uh, Ms. Valentina, would you like to say something else for the final uh, what? No. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. If you, if Ms. Valentina would like to say something, okay. Um, let me respond to what Ms. Valentina has said, and I would agree um, uh, completely with the fact that we have to nourish and help the judges which are in the system who are справедливо і абсолютно неоправдано свою роботу. Fair, uh, justice, uh, uh, fair judges, but they suffer from uh, 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 from uh, uh, the bad uh, judicial bodies. Uh, and our job is uh, to, is to is not, uh, uh, my dream personally, and, and, uh, and, uh, the prince, and our principles uh, are uh, uh, not to be able to uh, persecute the judges uh, and um, um, my dream is uh, not to uh, uh, to control them or to have um, uh, or to write uh, uh, something about them in Facebook. I think the job of a fair judiciary um, and the civil society and the politicians who have obtained uh, 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 power uh, is to, for the uh, system uh, uh, to actually reward uh, fair uh, judges uh, and uh, to remove the unfair ones. We still, still see those facts for the system to remove the unfair ones and uh, to, to appoint uh, the ones that have integrity. I think this is something that uh, each of us should have that kind of guideline in mind. Thank you, Mikhailo. Ms. Valentina, your final uh, conclusion. I'd like to uh, conclude with two statements. International partners insist, and I'm convinced that we uh, aspire for that, uh, to reinforce the rule of law in Ukraine. I'd like to point out that the rule of law is not just uh, about the court. The rule of law is about the entire system. And we definitely can't reinforce or achieve the rule of law by violating the principle of the rule of law. I'd like to uh, uh, point to the uh, delicacy, uh, to the to the uh, fine nature of uh, the points we're discussing that would lead to the rule of law. Uh, it doesn't matter who uh, uh, expressed uh, himself better. Uh, let's step, let's make these steps together to attain the results. And let's see which steps will approximate us uh, to our goal and which uh, will deteriorate the situation. Uh, number two is that the system should be cleansed, that should 
uh, have a self-cleaning function. Um, we can only be talking about the reduction of the uh, of, 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 of of the number of these problems, and to to uh, introduce uh, uh, an order, a procedure that would do that. And uh, I think the system is uh, capable of solving uh, the majority of problems, but such problems as the key problems, as very serious ones, cannot be tackled by the system itself. We need uh, a comprehensive political will. Such problems must be uprooted together. Along with the president, with the judicial system, by the Verkhovna Rada, by the public. Otherwise, we will not solve these problems. Thank you, Ms. Valentina. It's 11.18, and we have to conclude this dialogue. It seems to me that uh, I hope that it was uh, interesting for the viewers. For us, uh, 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 the key for us is to uh, unite the efforts uh, to overcome the uh, serious problems we have in the judicial system. We ob obviously need a political will. These are the conclusions of this dialogue today on the judicial reform. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to thank all the speakers. The, and I'd like to make an announcement that at noon, we will resume uh, a dialogue with other participants on a very important topic, the reform of the law enforcement agencies. Thank you all.
Hello, dear attendees. Hello, dear speakers. This panel is devoted to the reform of the law enforcement agencies and uh, criminal justice. And I think this reform is as important as the previous ones. And I'm sure that the expert in this, the experts in this field, are on highest demand because the law enforcement uh, law enforcement agencies should respond to the offenses which uh, um, uh, emerge, especially as the coronavirus uh, pandemic has uh, persisted. Uh, we need more response. Uh, I am Yevgen uh, Kropivin. I am the expert of the Center for Political and Legal Reforms. I'm going to moderate this event. I'd like to introduce to you our respectable speakers that uh, represent various institutions and um, we have today with us Andri um, Subchuk who is a member of the committee for law enforcement um, activities the deputy head of the committee we have Oleg C. Bonyuk who represents the office of the general prosecution general prosecutor's office in the department of uh, uh, the investments in critical critical um, criminal um, uh, policy. We have the representatives of NGOs, and Mikhail Kamenev, who is the executive director of the Prava Zahisni Initiative, and um, um, Volodymyr Petrakovsky, who is a senior teacher at the Department of Criminal um, and Procedural Law, National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, and. We also have uh, a chief of the advisory mission of uh, the European Union, Mr. Anti Hartikainen. So we are not limited in time, it seems to me. I think this subject is um, something we can talk about forever, but we are always, always pressed for time. So it's uh, an hour and 15 minutes. I think it's sufficient to hear the representatives of each of the, of the sides in this dialogue on, on the reform. And I'd like to give the, uh, the, uh, the first floor to Mr. Andre. And my question is very simple. The parliament, which gives life to the legislation uh, from which any reform starts, uh, which sets uh, out the rules of play. We know that the Committee for Law Enforcement has worked fruitfully this year, but there is some criticism of their activity. There is uh, criticism, criticism of the lack of activity on certain cases. And it's very important to hear for us Uh, uh, the assessment of the opposition in the committee, because it seems to me that impacts the objectivity uh, as far so as uh, Mr. Savchuk is the initiator of the legislative initiatives of the reform of the police, which is also very important uh, because we can talk about the law enforcement uh, in such a narrow connotation. So um, you have uh, five to seven minutes and uh, please uh, follow the time frame. Thank you. I will try to be concise, although you are absolutely right, it's almost impossible in this discussion. And I'd like to take this opportunity and um, make a few statements of my vision of the subject matter we're discussing today. Uh, the first statement, we've been launching a lot of initiatives uh, in the last five to seven years on the national police and the, uh, the prosecution office and so on, but uh, no, almost none of them ha has 
been finalized. Some of them have been completed at 15, others at 20% and so on. And there is no sufficient critical analysis of the status, current status, where we are. Um, and instead of uh, pushing through some fundamentals, oftentimes we, I mean, all together, the Verkhovna Rada, the cabinet of ministers, and we, we try to invent something else. Let's do something else. Let's do something else. As a result, we have um, um, a big um, uh, hell of initiatives, uh, legislative provisions that we approve, but we do not uh, follow the implementation, uh, nor, we, nor do we give the answer why has it taken place? What does it take to push it through? So the parliament more or less is doing its work, but the improvement of the rules uh, is impossible without the status of execution um, or the analysis of the status of execution. I, uh, we compare. We can compare it with um, uh, it with uh, um, um, a remodeling in uh, uh, a big apartment. You have to lay down the parquet and uh, uh, put up uh, the wallpaper, and uh, you can do the plumbing and. You're doing this at the same time. Something, something is done at 20%, something else is at 30%, and then the customer comes and says, this is not a remodeling, right? This is rubbish. So we have to do this, then that, then that. There's, there must be a clear sequence. Uh, you can't uh, uh, paint the walls um, and then uh, install the electrical wires, right? So I think it's the reform of the law enforcement, uh, although I don't like that um, uh, uh, name. Um, it looks like it, is, it has a status of uh, um, November of uh, uh, 2020. Another statement, which uh, is a big problem, and I would agree with the moderator that any system, any reform is composed of three um, uh, things, uh, the rules, the resources, and the people. Without these three components, nothing is going to work. And all of these components must be synchronized. But of course, um, the rules go first, because without the rules, you can't understand which resources uh, does it take, which uh, human resources, which people does it take, and so on. And if we look at the entire law enforcement system, um, the, uh, the Ministry of Interior, uh, the NABU, the Prosecution Office, um, uh, the State Bureau of Investigations, they have a pretty, they're pretty well equipped. But as a regulatory framework, it has been uh, developed, it has been created, it's good. But in terms of the resources, um, the expert community and the active citizens know very well that the funding of the Ministry of Interior in Ukraine is at a very high level. The total, uh, the total budgets compete with the budgets of the army, let alone the uh, welfare system. So within uh, the funds, uh, the law enforcement agencies are um, supported very well compared to doctors, for instance. So we, as a Verkhovna Rada, uh, as we vote for the state budget of Ukraine uh, three years in a row, we provide the resources to them. We provide the funds. Go ahead, guys, use the funds. It's a lot of money. But there's a third component. So the two first components, the rules and the resources, the funds, are tackled. But there's a third component, people. Without the people, without the good leadership, nothing happens. No system works. So I'd like to end this statement uh, laying the biggest claim to the previous uh, leadership of this country, from the, the, the fifth president and everyone who worked with him, and up to Mr. Zelensky and everyone around him, and uh, is totally controlling the law enforcement system. They haven't solved the problem of manpower. For seven years, we've been talking about the high quality selection of people, competition procedures, the filters that should work, the real uh, levels of attestation, the levels of promotion, nothing works in quality. Uh, we started this discussion uh, uh, on the uh, police commission. It's a, a long-standing story that has uh, continued for 
uh, sixth year. I know this very well because I uh, served as a deputy of the um, Kiev City Council and I um, uh, was uh, forming the uh, police commission. And uh, this story has uh, been abandoned completely. It's uh, drafted in the law. We provided the funds, but it doesn't work. Why? Because the management of the Ministry of Interior isn't willing. Uh, and that is the primary cause why uh, the, uh, the quality of the uh, work of the law enforcers is, is, is lagging behind. Uh, I wouldn't say the reform is lagging behind. So we, we know the story of Karhar Lik. For me, it's a litmus test of the, uh, of the reform of the Ministry of Interior. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how they protect themselves. It doesn't matter how uh, the police. They say that the police is the mirror of the society. It's the result of the lack of internal procedures of a control, of selection, of recruitment of staff, and we have terrible cases of um, tortures at workplace. We can't get any worse. Let me uh conclude this small talk uh, uh within the time frame and uh, by saying that we have to focus on the people that work in the law enforcement system where we get them from how do we how do they make their way to the position how do they report how does the control how does the system control them how are, how do they get promoted unless we focus on that in the nearest future i doubt very much that we can expect any substantial changes in the way the law enforcement agencies operate in the nearest future. My last comment about uh, my work as the first deputy of the head of uh, uh, the committee, we tried to ensure the parliamentary control. Yesterday we had a, um, another uh, scandalous uh, committee meeting with almost all the members from various factions demand regularly a good thing so that the general prosecutor should attend the committee meeting and reports so that the leadership of uh, the State Bureau of Investigations, uh, um, and I think it's a very interesting word combination, the management of uh, DBR, he should also attend the meeting uh, and report uh, on what is going on. And as part of the parliamentary control, we will be pressing them and we will demand mm -hmm one thing to execute the rules and procedures that we vote for which the, the rules that are enforced um, thank you i think that's all for, for now thank you mr andre for your statements and thank you for formulating a certain framework for this discussion so that each reform is composed of three components um, i reiterate this statement often because uh, there are various approaches to our reforms and often we use only one of the components uh, somebody is focused on the legislation others are focused on the hr others are focused on the management but as a result we can't achieve the effect uh, if the manpower works according to the old rules it's not gonna happen just like if we have good legislation but we don't have the right people uh, nothing is going to change and it's a question to the next speaker, to Alexander Banyuk. Um, what about the prosecution office? A year ago, the prosecution office had a carte blanche for the reforms. Uh, because of the formation of the Mono majority, there was a legislation which uh, was proposed by the presidential team and was developed for the reform, was drafted for the reform. Reattestation of the prosecutors, um, at each prosecution officer, uh, changed the people, replaced the people, and all the managerial practices also should have been changed. Uh, um, the prosecution office got uh, uh, new management several times. Um, have we attained, have you attained these goals uh, that uh, were posed to the, uh, for the reform of the prosecution office? Have all of these three components been uh, um, uh, been uh, uh, met because we hear often that the prosecution office has not become an independent agency and uh, nothing has changed. Uh, 
and uh, we see uh, political pressure uh, that has increased on the prosecution office. Is that the case, in your opinion? Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Um, in order to be exact in my uh, formulations, I would like to use some visualization to reflect the answer to the systemic question which was posed. I would like to right away thank you for the statement um, which was um, made by the previous speaker that the great transformation will never be efficient uh, on the um, uh, achieve results which are expected unless it uh, uh, tackles some important aspects as rules, people, and resources. Um, and it is the reform of the prosecution office uh, um, that uh, is based on three these three important prerequisites. To develop the legislation which uh, was adopted last year, we're still in the process of transformation. It's still going on. And now we have this component and of uh, evaluation of the local prosecutors. Uh, these are the prosecutors with whom uh, general uh, public uh, is uh, communicating and counteracting. So the next uh, numbers, uh, as you can see, uh, should uh, uh, be considered about the reboot or reload of the HR. I don't know the examples of other institutions. Maybe you can name me where all the key experts were either re-evaluated or re-attested and uh, everyone was uh, reappointed. And this process uh, is going on on a very transparent uh, procedure. They are passing the test and only after the uh, positive uh, results of uh, the uh, evaluation, uh, they can uh, be appointed to the newly created uh, prosecutor's office. You know that from January, the uh, general prosecutor's office started its work and only those prosecutors uh, were appointed there from the um, general prosecutor's office who had positive results of the evaluations. So only uh, those prosecutors from the regions uh, who passed successfully the evaluation had the chance uh, to work in the in newly established offices. And from uh, October 15th this year, uh, the prosecutors uh, of local prosecutors, uh, prosecution offices are now uh, being evaluated. And as you can see uh, that the numbers are quite uh, positive. Uh, we cannot tell you the final uh, result because the commission is uh, still working on, but we will share those uh, results. Uh, we are planning that the first stage evaluation of the local uh, prosecutor's offices will start from the third December 3 and will end uh, at the beginning of 2021. And it will be possible to establish the district prosecutor's office. Then we could uh, speak about some uh, results. But dear colleagues, I believe that the effect uh, which our moderator was mentioning, we should be in fact objective. We can feel uh, this effect. I mean, general public can feel this effect only when some time passes, when the new rules come into effect. We have a brainstorm of the senior staff about the institutional reform. On the 27th of November, uh, the senior staff of the uh, General Prosecutor's Office will think about the structural territorial aspects uh, of establishment of district prosecutor offices. This uh, will be new prosecutor offices. Uh, to my mind, uh, the two recruitment uh, uh, ways were important. Only 10% of the candidates um, came uh, externally and uh, they were successful and uh, became prosecutors. But people had this uh, chance from the outside uh, who had never worked in the prosecutor's uh, offices before. 
as it was uh, already recollected by the speakers, transformation uh, of the prosecutor's office in uh, the uh, HR um, uh, area can become uh, an example for other institutions. Uh, I think that it's a good uh, experience and uh, in August, we had the first strategic uh, planning uh, session that's uh, the topic of uh, rules and new approaches in our work and as a result we adopted the strategy of development of prosecution offices for 2021-2023 a very important part of the strategy is the vision and values that's what should be shared uh, by all the prosecutors. The uh, main focusing point, the guidelines which the prosecutors uh, should follow in their day-to-day -day routine uh, life. These are the goals which we are planning to achieve in the nearest years, and it's aimed at uh, the fulfillment of the constitutional functions uh, of uh, the prosecutor's office. And first of all, uh, of course, the rule of law, the security of citizens, your integration, the economical growth and creation uh, of attractive environment for business and attraction of investment. Now we are drafting the uh, um, action plan of this strategy about the systemic steps. Our speakers have mentioned in the strategy of development, uh, the importance of coordinating has been highlighted. We understand that that the uh, criminal uh, policy uh, is implemented uh, by uh, other institutions, but uh, prosecution of it as, as a coordination uh, center is obliged uh, also to submit the proposals to the uh, criminal legal policy. And under the heading of the uh, prosecutor general, the working group started its uh, work um, and the members of the uh, National Defense and Security Councils are also participating. They are discussing uh, this uh, topic of uh, coordination. It's very important to have the systemic approaches to establish the prerequisites. Do you remember the decree of the president adopted the strategy of uh, reform of the criminal justice and law enforcement uh, of, uh, authorities? And this document appeared to be quite effective, and uh, uh, the work of this working group is aimed uh, to draft the new strategic document to have the systemic approach uh, of uh, development of law enforcement authorities in Ukraine. Also, uh, some other steps, uh, coordinating steps uh, are being planned. The uh, crime survey. Uh, is uh, aimed at the criminogenic uh, situation in Ukraine and also attitude uh, of um, people uh, to the crimes. And then the coordination work of the Office of the General Prosecutor and uh, also the steps on forming the policy of the criminal prosecution. No one has even talked about this uh, topic that uh, those important aspects of uh, law enforcement uh, should be based on those surveys. We can uh, say that it's one of the strategic uh, sector is the protection of investments. Uh, the prosecutor is perceived uh, to act to uh, prosecute, but in fact, no, the prosecution uh, offices are protecting rights and freedoms of citizens and the state. And in this very complicated, uh, economically complicated uh, time where Ukraine is now, and of course, uh, the uh, 
pandemic situation influenced that and uh, the uh, prosecutor's office introduced for the first time a very important uh, tool uh, to protect uh, the uh, uh, rights uh, of uh, the enterprises and the investments. So, so we now have a department which uh, I'm heading. Uh, it says the department is responsible for communication with business environment for open dialogue uh, on the functions uh, which the prosecutor office uh, have and about the cases, the specific cases. And we have around uh, 80 cases which we are following and discussing with the business uh, uh, entities. It's a very important tool which uh, should uh, uh, facilitate this uh, transparency of functioning of uh, the prosecutor's offices, uh, that our activities uh, should be understandable uh, by the community and thus uh, increasing the trust uh, to our activities. Some other steps uh, in the HR sphere, which I believe are very important, which uh, have a very substantial uh, value. We have uh, planned a number of uh, innovations. The system of individual evaluation uh, of uh, the uh, performance of uh, prosecutors individually and uh, in general. This will be a one year and four year cycles. And, it, uh, and there will be a possibility that according to the criteria adopted by the general prosecutor, prosecutor general uh, to motivate a, a prosecutor to have a high level performance and then to have the possibility to check whether this performance meets uh, the minimal uh, criteria which will be adopted. Together with our partners and uh, experts, we have started drafting a very uh, important uh, draft, uh, prosecutor's uh, office uh, and uh, the society. So uh, they will be uh, human, uh, people-oriented services, uh, which will be transformed according to the needs of the society. We have an ambitious goal to grow the trust uh, to us. The example of other countries uh, shows uh, that the times, of course, is needed in bigger Eastern uh, countries. They needed uh, five, 10 years uh, to grow this trust. But we believe that we do not have the possibility uh, other than uh, to move uh, forward as uh, for the new prosecutors uh, to perform efficiently and the level of their knowledge uh, was in line with the, the area where we live, both uh, from the uh, criminal situation and uh, the life where we're living. The training center for the prosecutors uh, was established, and uh, they are focusing on the practical knowledge, using uh, the best practices, uh, international ones, and also the national. Uh, so I can uh, make a statement that, that the prosecution is uh, developing, and uh, the citizens will uh, feel it in the nearest future when uh, this perception will. Uh, transfer into the trust. I cannot uh, answer uh, exactly, but I believe it won't take too many years. Mr. Oleksii, thanks uh, for such a detailed presentation about the future of the uh, prosecutor's office. Now, I uh, haven't uh, felt uh, that uh, we uh, had the evaluation of what have been uh, achieved, but I think that with uh, other speakers, we will have the chance uh, to answer this request. Uh, just a very practical uh, question. As we're discussing uh, this topic uh, at the committee, and I think it will be very interesting to listen to a short answer. Uh, what is the situation uh, with the, the courts about the uh, renewal uh, on their positions of the prosecutors? Because uh, uh, it's uh, very good uh, that there was a, a reboot of the system, but um, I quite clearly re uh, remember 
the law uh, named uh, Rebbe Shapko. Uh, but we knew uh, that uh, there will be appeals by the prosecutors for their dismissal. Uh, uh, Mr. Oleksii, if you can give a short answer, we will be thankful. Uh, there are uh, both uh, cases uh, which uh, uh, were uh, won uh, by the prosecution uh, prosecutors uh, and those who which were lost. Uh, the Supreme Court has uh, six proceedings um, and we are waiting for the final decision of the Supreme Court. So in the percentage, uh, 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 we win 30% of uh, cases and we have a very uh, strong stance that if uh, they uh, uh, prosecutors are uh, losing uh, or having very negative evaluation, uh, then uh, we are winning uh, those cases. We can uh, come back to this question after our um, uh, speeches of all other speakers. The consultative mission uh, EUAM uh, is playing a very important role in the reform of law enforcement uh, authorities because all the three components which we have been discussed uh, are being covered by this institution and it's the police uh, and the, the National Investigation uh, Bureau uh, and uh, the uh, Institute of uh, uh, Criminal Offenses uh, started its work uh, and the UAM uh, also participated uh, in uh, their establishment. So for me, it will be very interesting um, how systemic you see the reforms uh, in uh, this uh, area, uh, because uh, some uh, areas uh, uh, were already mentioned, what we had in uh, 2008 uh, as a document and what we are lacking right now. And I believe that it's very important to reform in a systemic way. and. Um, as uh, the EUAM is uh, functioning uh, from when uh, Maidan has ended. Could you tell uh, whether we are moving in the right direction? Thank you very much, uh, dear counterparts, dear partners, dear all. It's, it's my great pleasure to speak here in this uh, forum today. And of course, my focus is in this progress of law enforcement reforms in Ukraine. I'm not able to go that much into details because of these time uh, limits. But first, uh, I would like to start uh, uh, of that, that we have been now here in Ukraine, our mission, six years. And uh, our key counterpart uh, has been actually the, all, all the time uh, national police. Uh, and we cooperate very closely in a number of key areas. And our ultimate objectives or goal is to increase public trust in the police. We think that uh, Ukraine deserves uh, a police that serves uh, the needs of Ukrainian people and ensures their rights, freedoms, safety and security. And I can say that there is a lot of positive uh, development. First of all, regarding public order. The national police, they have been able to implement this uh, concept of dialogue policing, where they, before these public uh, events, different kind of events, demonstrations, so on, they contact those organizers. And also during the event, they keep in, in contact with them. <coughs> and then if there will be like a counter, demonstration or, or counter protest, uh, then they also communicate with those, uh, those people in order to prevent the different kind of conflicts. Then uh, they have been also able to uh, adapt very well, actually, this European model to, to control and, and uh, take care of this public order. And they are, they are using this like a graduated approach uh, to using force. Then one extremely actual uh, issue is this uh, tackling uh, domestic violence. Uh, and uh, we are currently very actively uh, dealing with, uh, with this issue. We are providing support for our, 
our counterparts, international police, and actually tomorrow there will be, for example, one handover uh, ceremony of, of uh, vehicles and equipment for, for national police groups who are to respond to these uh, domestic violence uh, incidents. They are formally known as uh, Polina teams. Then, traditionally, our key focus has been uh, in, in developing or in increasing investigative uh, capacity, of, capacity of, of national police. And the last area in this regard is this, uh, our support for the law on misdemeanors where actually we would like to enhance this effectiveness in, in using resources and to handle these, these cases on a very non-bureaucratic uh, uh, way. We can say that the police, they, they have a, a pretty good progress uh, during these, uh, these six years, but of course, like it was mentioned, that a lot remains to be done. And, uh, we surely we would uh, like these uh, reform uh, efforts to accelerate. There we, we have very, very good common understanding with our representative from the Verhofna Rada. Uh, at the same time, when we cooperate very closely with the police, we also support uh, reform uh, efforts uh, in many other law enforcement agencies in this wider civilian security sector. And recently we have, for instance, invested a lot of resources in provisions of advice on the ongoing prosecution service reform. And especially in this attestation process of prosecutors, which I consider to be a good, very good examples of a great success, actually. Uh, and then we have been also focusing very much this uh, security service reform. And in this regard, we have been having very close cooperation <laughs> with the uh, Verhofna Rada, because this, this law on, on, on security service, it's a, it's a big, big effort. And it has been taking already uh, actually one year time <laughs> to, to deal with that. And let's hope that we will soon get it uh, adopted. Uh, we, our, our, our cooperation with the, with the parliament, with, with the Verhofna Rada, is extremely important because often these reforms, they start uh, uh, with development of, of legislative basis for those reforms. Then when we are looking a little bit to the future, we of course stand ready to expand uh, our already ongoing support to the establishment of Bureau of Economic Security. And we believe that uh, this uh, successful establishment of this Bureau uh, would be very important, not only for this uh, uh, Bureau itself, but also it's an essential precondition to successfully reforming this state security service. Then, like already, I was a little bit referring to this reform of, of security service. I can say that uh, this reform of security and intelligence uh, structures in Ukraine, uh, it's, it's one of the most difficult reforms that uh, Ukraine must uh, undertake. There are many, many challenges in this regard, and we know that it, it's not easy. But uh, we think that we must be successful in, in doing this. We, in our mission, we very much welcome this latest draft law on security service as a step in the right direction. At the same time, we also believe that there is still uh, some room uh, for, for improvement in, in this draft law. And, and uh, actually, for example, one missing part is this uh, roadmap to reduce uh, these law enforcement functions of security service, that how it would be done. We would like to see, uh, see that kind of a uh, plan. Of course, we have also recognized and we have our experience in our home countries that uh, uh, the security service reform, it needs time. And we also agree that it should not weaken Ukraine's uh, capacity 
to effectively deal with external and internal threats uh, to national security. Then about these positive developments, we welcome the new law on intelligence and its provisions to establish uh, its parliamentary oversight committee over intelligence agencies, including security service. And we consider that this is a significant step in the right uh, direction and our mission, we stand ready to support uh, the establishment of this uh, committee. Then, uh, of course, uh, they, we have some, some challenges. It was already a little bit mentioned, this selection uh, process, that it's, it's, it's a challenge, but, uh, but I think that uh, recently has been a big, big challenge that uh, across actually all the agencies, uh, uh, that uh, there have been a lot of uh, changes uh, in the top management of, of these uh, agencies. And then because of that also often uh, like that, like, like uh, competing uh, visions and goals. And we, of course, we would like to help uh, our counterpart agencies to stabilize uh, and to build up new cultures. Uh, uh, we know, know that this is very difficult once again. <laughs> There's a lot of old traditions, but we think that uh, this is something what we need to be once again uh, successful. And we, like I already mentioned earlier, that things will not happen uh, overnight. Uh, but in, in general, I can say that uh, we are moving in the right uh, direction. And uh, we will, from our side, uh, continue to offer our close cooperation and, and support. And uh, I think that, that one, one extremely important thing uh, is that uh, there is a broad public buy-in for this kind of reforms. And uh, I think that uh, also they support this uh, path uh, outlined uh, forward. Thank you very much. And now I'm of course pleased to answer all the questions. Thank you. Дякую. Дякую за таку uh, гарну доповідь і дякую за те, що ви Thank you for such a good report and uh, that you mentioned uh, almost uh, all the institutions. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, law enforcement uh, reform is in fact a very broad one because it covers a lot of agencies. And I am very thankful to the previous speaker that he mentioned uh, all of them. So in fact, it's one reform uh, which constitutes a number of institutions. And it's very complicated to uh, speak um, about it. Uh, we have the representative of the general prosecutor's uh, office and we know that um, it uh, acts uh, as a coordination center and uh, it's true that the security service uh, still uh, have uh, this function of the uh, pre-trial investigation uh, can a prosecutor execution uh, office uh, deal with uh, the new role because we are moving to the new uh, European model when the criminal uh, policy uh, is uh, defined uh, by the prosecution institution uh, but not separately uh, by a different law enforcement institution and I would like to ask this question to Vladimir Petrikovsky as an expert uh, on the prosecution office reform How how the prosecution office is ready to move from the Soviet vertical system to the European type model of prosecution office. Thank you for your question. Given, in my opinion, the prosecution office doesn't have any other choice but to rebuild itself and to undertake a coordination role. And it's not even a, a question of whether the prosecution office should undertake this role or not. Uh, the question is when the prosecution office will admit that it is exercising this role. Uh, as a, uh, um, an ex-prosecution prosecutor, I should say, uh, that it's, uh, the prosecutor who should be responsible for the, uh, 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 the workload of the court uh, and uh, whether they, um, a suspect uh, should uh, be uh, uh, tried or not. Uh, so it's uh, 
the cases that the prosecution officer should uh, um, um, be charged with, uh, because if they don't want to charge themselves with certain cases, then uh, uh, it's wasted and the taxpayer's money will be wasted also uh, if they don't want to deal with these cases. So, it's, uh, so the question is, when will the prosecution office admit uh, to the society that they should take that role? Uh, according to the European standards, according to the civilized rules. Uh, I think that's uh, how this question should be put. And if we go back to, and uh, in this aspect, I'd like to argue that uh, it's important to talk not just about the coordinating role of the prosecution office, but so that the parliament and the civil society uh, to understand that the pretrial investigation uh, should not be uh, divided into anti-corruption and others. Uh, we call them the law enforcement agencies uh, uh, in general, but for some reason, the NABU, which is the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, is, um, is uh, discussed in the next panel for some reason. So the prosecution offices and uh, uh, the government should also allocate the, the funds and the, the resources. So in this uh, aspect, we should uh, approach the parliament and uh, Andriy Sachuk in particular, the uh, person who uh, drafts laws and uh, is uh, responsible for approving the laws. We should not fragment the system. Individual separate rules are created. Uh, we shouldn't be talking about NABU, the National Anti-Corruption uh, Bureau, separately, or SBU, the State Security Service. They try to make up their own rules. They try to invent their own um, uh, rules uh, because they uh, are faced with uh, the special threats and so on. The police uh, have drafted their own rules uh, uh, and uh, are tackling with uh, the, what we call the... Uh, the, the um, legalized thieves, right? So um, we don't un understand the logic logic behind this. Um, and we are coming to the aspect that uh, this is not done through some conscious policy, state policy, but they try to fit some people's needs. And in this aspect, if we talk about the anti-corruption uh, 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 bodies, they also try to do this for certain people. If we talk about the uh, SBU, they try to fit somebody else's needs. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, SBU can uh, bring in certain decisions into the parliament, the same applies to the police. There, there are certain uh, ministers who want to push certain uh, decisions in parliament. So we need to build, uh, if we have the rules, then, the resources and then the people. In our case, first we select the people and then find out which rules do these people want. Uh, just like the Ryabashapka reform. Uh, it's a classical example when the reform is a tailor-made for a certain person. And here I'd like to give an example of, um, of the consequences. Ukraine in 2017, launched a qualification a commission of uh, the prosecution office. That was one of the requirements of the Council of Europe uh, to which uh, Ukraine uh, agreed, and that reform was implemented. So we sort of uh, elevated the standards of the Council of Europe, including the issue of prosecutors' independence. And then uh, in 2019, this commission was liquidated, was uh, abolished just to allow uh, General Prosecutor Ryaboshapka to pass the reform he had wanted, despite the fact that we were on the path to the structural reform, uh, applied uh, a lot of efforts, got the international support. We completely abolished it then for the sake of one person. So we are having this now today. We have a several decisions of the Constitutional Court with regards to the presidential powers, whether they have been executed or not is a question. Are we afraid because there is some respectable person 
next parliament law uh, 2116 uh, which uh, replaced roman truba so we rebooted the state bureau of investigations so the question is to roman truba why did you change the director and how did you uh, elect the director so it's also um uh, it's also a political question like it is with uh, rebo shapka that the general prosecutor was dismissed for political reasons so almost all these reforms that we have now uh, there's a problem of design of those reforms of these reforms uh, is because we put the rules after the people instead of uh deciding on the rules and then uh deciding with the people first we select the people and then we match the rules for these people the rules for these people so that's the key challenge of reforms we will be wasting a lot of efforts and funds to rotate across this circle first uh the people then the rules and the next prosecutor will always be disappointed of these reforms rather than agreeing on the rules and then executing the rules that's my opinion thank you thank you Volodymyr, for such a, a critical uh, assessment uh, during these uh, dialogues and discussions that we have had uh, in the last two days and we'll have more of them this um, uh, uh, talking point is discussed all the time we have a, a problem of uh, of trust to the good people that uh, not that, that, that some good people will be appointed to the position and they will change everything we shift the emphasis from the rules from transparency um, uh, from uh, the common standards uh, 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 to the trust in good people and that's a problem of the reform we are not an exception here um, and that was illustrated very well and we can develop this uh, um, a statement. We have another major uh, presentation or, 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 or speech uh, by Mikhail Kamenev, um, and uh, I think we didn't touch upon the issue of the Ministry of Interior and the National Police uh, well enough. Because of the uh, pandemic of the coronavirus, the police are um, an, uh, a law enforcement agency which uh, encountered new challenges after the pandemic. Uh, there are a lot of cases of uh, fraud, uh, uh, cyber security issues, uh, um, and they also have to ensure public uh, order um, uh, to control the uh, during the restrictive measures during the quarantine. Uh, so and it's the regions in Ukraine that have their vision of whether the uh, these quarantine uh, measures should or should not uh, be executed so and i think the police should respond here so we have two questions to Mikhailo. the first question is the covid question whether the police uh, succeeded in the last year and another question is about the reform it seems like the reform has stopped three years ago did it attain its results or is there something which must be done something critical uh, we already mentioned that the police have solved the problems uh, uh, during the maidan and which was spoken of after the maidan that everyone wanted to correct uh, uh, in the post maidan years uh, thank you Yevhen. if we talk about how the police responded to the coronavirus uh, challenges we have to argue that there's a lack of capability of the state apparatus to ensure the execution of the anti-coronavirus restrictions uh, um, the police have uh, made uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, protocols uh, worth of 17 uh, thousand uh, uh, grivna each year. Uh, uh, but uh, the courts uh, responded uh, to these cases. Almost all of these cases uh, uh, collapsed in course, courts because there was no 
uh, proportion uh, between the sanctions and the infringements. So all of these uh, protocols, the uh, police uh, uh, protocols were just um, just a wasted paper and a wasted state resource. Um, uh, the picture when the police in spring detained 10 or 15 people uh, and one a man who was uh, crossing the river, the Dnieper River, uh, was swimming across the, the river. We remember the chief sanitary doctor said that, you know, this ban on staying in the park was just to intimidate people. So the question is, do we need such a law enforcement? This isn't something the society expects. And and uh, the restrictions being implemented by the state uh, 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 do not uh, show any legitimacy. The ban on the markets, uh, the ban on uh, cinemas uh, uh, is about the legitimacy of the introduced uh, instruction, restrictions. Um, uh, uh, the Constitutional Court, which uh, argued uh, about the non-constitutional uh, character of these restrictions and uh, filed this case with the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, and the resolution of the Cabinet of Ministers uh, um, was no longer effective, but the Constitutional Court uh, uh, said that any restrictions of uh, uh, the human rights should uh, uh, meet uh, the provisions of the Constitution. So any lawyer can understand, can construe this, that there are no constitutional grounds to introduce these restrictions. It's a big problem. And because of this, the police cannot uh, use and um, force uh, people to uh, follow these restrictions. So it seems like the, uh, the uh, police are compelling people to do something. It's, if we talk about the reform of the police in general and something being expected of the, of the Ministry of Interior, uh, external observers argue that the reform has failed. The reform of the patrol police is just 10% of the system. The remainder has not been reformed. They changed the uniform. They put on new damage, uh, new badges with numbers. Um, but they don't even always put those badges on. We cannot always identify a policeman. So the reform is over, but it has uh, suffocated without being launched. And this is what we see on the agenda of the Ministry of Interior. And if we, are, if we talk about this current event, uh, we are in the club of the Committee of Ministers of Ukraine. And that's a demonstration that the power is ready for a dialogue with uh, the civil society because uh, uh, a, this event was uh, organized by uh, the resuscitation uh, package of reforms, which is a non-government uh, organization. But who is one of the, uh, who are the speakers? It, at the previous uh, panels, we had representatives of the power of the, at the top level, heads of committees, ministers, mm, heads of sexual uh, agencies. Now, we only have the representative of the opposition. We don't see any representative of the ruling party in parliament. We don't, uh, we don't see here anybody from the executive branch. We only see the representative of the prosecution office. With all my respect, not even the deputy general prosecutor, we only see a uh, head of department. I directly report to the general prosecutor, yes, you are, but uh, it's another level of political responsibility. Uh, we, we don't see anybody from the Ministry of Interior here. I know that this plan was uh, um, uh, scheduled to, uh, to to uh, include the minister. Uh, a minister normally never attends uh, NGO events, right? I think it, for the first time I uh, was hoping to, uh, to meet uh, the Minister of Interior. That never happened. I would like to pose a question to Mr. Andri. 
How often does your minister attend the meetings of a sectoral committee? I don't think I've seen him there ever. It's not a rhetorical question. He's never been there. That's right. Yeah. In this convocation, in the previous convocation, I remember, I don't remember the minister to attend the, the, the meetings of the sectoral committee. I know of other ministers who attend me, uh, meetings of the sectoral committees. There is no parliamentary control, uh, let alone our role uh, as of the civil society. The reform is impossible without a dialogue, without a compromise. Uh, Baron Munhausen cannot uh, uh, push himself out uh, of the marsh. Uh, neither the prosecution officer, nor the Ministry of Interior, nor the security service of Ukraine can push itself out and reform itself. The SBU, we have had promises of reforming it for many years. We see new attempts of the legislative regulation, but they don't engage the representatives of the civil society, and we don't believe that this reform is going to happen. Even when some, something happens, uh, what uh, Antti mentioned, the concept of the Scandinavian uh, model of uh, the public order, it's a good concept, but no, nobody knows about it at the lowest level of the national police. The people who should administer it, we don't have uh, an instruction of what should the police do to guard, to protect uh, public order, uh, or peaceful assemblies. Some operational standard procedures have been introduced, but it's not the, uh, uh, these aren't the instructions approved. Of the, um, uh, and nobody knows about it at the police. The people who have to execute these instructions, they don't know of them. Even the, the format of this document, we see that not our civil servants drafted it. It's not drafted by this country. It has been drafted to satisfy certain requirements or demands of our international partners. We don't have an interaction. We don't even have a capability for that dialogue uh, uh, to find the compromises, meaning that we don't have any chances for this reform to take place. Thank you, Mihailo. Uh, I really love your observations uh, about the level of uh, attendance at this dialogue, and it's not a question of uh, a single event. I would agree with you that the strategy of uh, the power uh, agencies has changed uh, um, uh, since the times of the Maidan, when uh, the engagement of the civil society was much higher uh, than it is now. Uh, and at least at that time, the uh, planning our reforms covered more than one or two years. It covered uh, five years. And that is a cornerstone of all the reforms. We don't have um, long-term planning, no sustainable policy. Uh, we uh, remembered the Ministry of Interior that has a strategy of reforms since 2017 to 2020. Uh, they have an action uh, uh, plan which was approved uh, only after uh, it had been effective for three years. Uh, but nobody has heard about this strategy. Nobody knows about the strategy. And it is not being executed. There are, um, it has ambitious goals, but this reform isn't moving forward. Uh, Mr. Oleksii mentioned the strategy of the reform of the prosecutor's office. And it's great that it's emerged. Um, if we go back to the past of the prosecutor's office, uh, they never had a sustainable vision that would uh, cover the pre-trial investigation uh, bodies. Uh, uh, and the oversight of uh, uh, the uh, uh, criminal offenses. But uh, uh, these are the day-to-day -day problems, the constitutional crisis, the managers change, the parliament changes, and so on. But there is no sustainable policy. That's a problem. Even though if it is there, it, these are just formal documents. Uh, and uh, nobody uh, checks uh, the level of its implementation. I have to apologize again, but uh, it seems to me that it's very important to understand the general picture. 
that we have. I'd like to point out that all the speakers were able to uh, speak. We have covered almost all the law enforcement agencies. And we probably did not mention uh, here the agencies of financial investigations, but I would like to ask each of the speakers if you have any small comment on what has been said. It is the right time, I think, now. I think uh, Mr. Andre is raising his hand and Mr. Volodymyr and Mr. Oleksii. Okay, so then use two minutes maximum because of uh, the time. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll be very brief uh, to correct myself as a disclaimer, because I said in my talk that uh, the legislative part of the reforms uh, has been done well uh, uh, with regards to all the agencies, but I forgot the SBU, uh, the State Security Service of Ukraine. And I should be clear to say that even though we have big problems with the, the State Bureau, Bureau of Investigations, DBR, yeah, some, some mistakes and so on, the, the, there is a law, it must be executed. It's not being enforced properly, but the, there are issues of recruitment and not being enforced and so on. But uh, the, the same with the, the police and the uh, general prosecution office, it's okay. But with the State Security Service, we have a very big problem of both the Ukrainian parliament and of the Ukrainian president. We clearly understand the decisions on the state security service are not made at Grushevskovo or at Volodymyrsko, but they are made at the Bankova street. And for a year and a half, there has been a dialogue. Let's make a counterintelligence agency out of SBU. Three times you have redrafted the law and you know the details. Um, They've submitted a separate law on the amendments in the criminal procedural code. And uh, it's just like my neighbor used to say, you are chasing the thief out of your house, but he's coming back into the window, right? There is no reform. So we still have fundamental problem with the state security service of Ukraine. There is no will or willingness at the Bankova Street, which is the presidential administration, uh, Please stop being foolish. There are framework agreements. Let's execute these agreements. And that can be done in just a few weeks. Thank you. Uh, right. In the context of SBU and uh, the Bureau of Financial Investigations, these are related because uh, if you uh, can't maintain in the criminal justice system, uh, it, it's will just flow into, part of its functions will flow into the service of uh, financial investigations. Uh, uh, it's quite unsafe because that way we accept that we should have economic security. But it's a, a very unsafe story in our conditions because the way we construe the concept of national policy versus economic uh, po um, uh, national security versus uh, economic uh, uh, security. Um, if we have these proposals about the uh, Bureau of Economic Security, we should understand that that's where uh, the safeguard for the state security service can be, where part of its staff hope that they will uh, be uh, working under another mask. Thank you, Volodymyr, Volodymyr Alexei. I must react to these statements um, and the articulation of certain laws, which uh, has a number of 113. Uh, according to this regulatory act, there are a lot of international experts, Ukrainian professionals. Whether it's good or not uh, is another question. But currently, there's a lot of work being done, not just uh, uh, with the amendments in the law, the transformation of uh, the staff, the uh, HR capital of the prosecution office, institutional transformations. The new rules are being drafted, which will determine the contents of operations of the hashtag that we are disseminating, the so-called new prosecutor's office, 
which will have a new uh, role, new prosecutors with new uh, worldviews that have uh, a past uh, um, new procedures, which will not uh, um, be obliged to anyone for uh, making their way there, except uh, for uh, their own skills. And we've met with uh, some uh, leading representatives of the of the business environment. We've engaged the businesses in drafting the standards uh, um, of the, the prosecution office, and we are open to dialogue with other representatives of the uh, civil society. And there was another statement, and an unsafe statement, I think, that the prosecutor's office seems to have enough functions to coordinate the prosecution, the law enforcement agencies. Uh, look at the Constitution, this organization and management, two words in the Constitution. According to the criminal code, it's the pretrial and investigation bodies that are responsible for the organization. Uh, whereas according to the Constitution, it's the prosecutor's office that should organize that activity. So we still have to work with the sectoral committee. By the way, the general prosecutor's office met, uh, attended uh, the meeting. Uh, of that committee and, and they plan to do this. But it's very important for us to, to communicate with the experts and to use an exact definition, uh, exact definitions and to uh, uh, impact uh, the right uh, uh, proposals uh, uh, to efficiently reform the prosecutor, uh, prosecutor's office. Uh, yeah, the draft law um, 3009A. Um, we can uh, keep discussing it. Mr. Antti, please. field offices and mobile unit that we are really present there also in the regions. And I, I would like to mention that, for example, regarding this uh, European model of, of uh, public order, that uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, in Odessa, in, uh, in Kharkiv, especially, they know this concept very well, uh, all, also these, these who are implementing uh, this concept. But of course, uh, we are not able to ensure that uh, all the police officers uh, in Ukraine uh, would know it yet, but they will. They are. They are. They are learning. And then, then uh, the security service uh, reform. Uh, uh, it's the key for the success of all these uh, uh, law enforcement uh, reforms, and it has also very important uh, or high impact. Uh, to this business and uh, and investment uh, climates and that's also what we need to remember thank you um, thank you and uh, mihailo if we make a summary uh, i think it's worth while to be based on some pillars in this uh, reform and the pillars must be constitutional values the rule of law the human rights any in any reform we should not try to circumvent the uh, provisions of the constitution uh, uh, allegedly that uh, this uh, uh, the law the, that it is outside of the cabinet of ministers uh, but it must uh, be a consistent government policy clear to everyone uh, so that these should be instruments political instruments uh, to not to develop an action plan and then to forget it and, uh, and just to generate a report. What accidentally have we done on this? We have to develop the government policy and implement it consistently. And thirdly is a necessary dialogue with the civil society because the end result of any reform should not just be the efficiency of the pre-trial investigation bodies and the law enforcement agencies, but the trust of the public. That must be a priority. Yeah, thank you, Mikhailo. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for this excellent talk, for this dialogue on the reform uh, of the law enforcement agencies and the criminal justice. And uh, I would like to wish our reform to be sustainable, predictable, and the one that accounts for the mistakes of predecessors and is moving 
forward despite uh, these mistakes. To uh, conclude on an optimistic note, I'd like to say that we have to compare the current status and what we had 10 or 15 years ago. I think we've made progress, maybe not as fast as everyone expected. Thank you all again.
Доброго дня, колеги. Мене звати Оксана Величко. Novikov, the chairman of the National Agency on Corruption Prevention of Ukraine, Ole Egberg Mikkelsen, ambassador of Kingdom of Denmark to Ukraine, Sergei Dekterenko, deputy state secretary of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine, Mikola Havronyuk, member of the board, director of scientific development of the Center for Political and Legal Reforms, Andriy Borovik, executive director of Transparency International Ukraine, and Daria Kalinuk, Executive Director and Member of the Board Anti-Corruption Action Center, will be online with us today. So, Yaroslav, let's start with you. So, we would like to ask the following. This, this, this ruling uh, of the Constitutional Court, which caused so many uh, problems in the country, and a lot of MPs uh, were saying that they awaited uh, for this uh, ruling. Did you expect this ruling? So you were coming to the parliament and you knew what are the anti-corruption reforms which had to be uh, implemented. So uh, in what you have succeeded and where did you fail? Thank you for the question. In fact, when uh, we were going to the parliament, we had a clear vision um, on uh, the development of anti-corruption infrastructure. And at the beginning, uh, in autumn 2019, we uh, were successful in our activities. We had uh, had uh, some uh, new uh, technical mechanism for uh, supervision. We also strengthened the uh, National Anti-Corruption Prevention Bureau with the, uh, the employees and uh, also uh, the movement forward was going on. And uh, it was not only uh, our evaluation, the uh, high anti-constitutional court uh, started functioning, but then uh, their uh, system collapsed. Uh, a number of people who came to power for the first time, they understood uh, that uh, they have their dirty secrets as well, and uh, there are issues uh, and uh, some schemes which uh, could be investigated uh, by an efficient anti-corruption system. And uh, these are the agencies with which it's not possible to negotiate. And everyone is saying this, in fact. And all uh, the um, professionals from the law enforcement system are, uh, these are bars, uh, judges, prosecutors are saying that uh, these uh, agencies were independent. The system started uh, functioning and it worked against this system because they were attacked in a systematic way, both uh, personally to the heads of those institutions, but also the attacks to the institutions themselves. And also uh, they were trying to undermine the legislative framework on which uh, those institutions existed. In the uh, recent time, our committee is aimed at not to develop the system because we do not have this possibility, but in uh, in a way to protect what we have already of in our committee, uh, we uh, were fighting against uh, the um, efforts uh, to uh, erase uh, the uh, existence of the institutions as well. Uh, then uh, the uh, system, um, there were efforts um, uh, to uh, decrease the, the number of persons who have to submit the e-declarations. And when they failed uh, to do this through the parliament, and uh, the uh, members of the government are uh, reacting very efficiently, in fact, and I'm very uh, 
uh, proud of this and w uh, we uh, break uh, the record uh, uh, by uh, adopting uh, the anti-corruption strategy in the cabinet of minister and uh, a number of people do not like this strategy because it's a quite an ambitious one but we have an understanding that uh, without a possibility to uh, decrease the financing of the uh, anti-corruption um, the, fund, uh, the funding fund, uh, for the anti-corruption institutions or, or to do something through the parliament because the majority is uh, quite um, uh, active. At the same time, through the judicial uh, institutions, through the constitutional court, and we have to influence uh, and we have to analyze the influence uh, of uh, different institutions. And we had heard the rumors uh, that uh, they um, uh, coordinated their efforts with some officials in the office of the uh, resident. And now we are facing uh, the fact uh, that uh, we have this ruling of the uh, Constitution Court and we have to manage to um, change uh, the legislation uh, uh, in order to protect the system which already exists. And uh, now uh, the state has already spent uh, a number uh, uh, huge numbers uh, of uh, funds to investigations uh, which cannot uh, be proceeded further. And uh, it's not possible to appeal uh, to this uh, ruling. That's why uh, we have to amend uh, the legislation. Today we uh, have a working uh, uh, group and uh, we will not be talking uh, about uh, the technical details uh, uh, because it will attract uh, too much uh, attention from the media. But the MPs uh, quite understand that that uh, without uh, criminal liability for uh, fraudulent uh, e-declarations and uh, the issue of further uh, blocking of the activities of the corruption system. So if we won't manage to do it uh, till the end of the year, we will have very bad consequences. This is the, the possibility for uh, those who have some criminal assets, they will try to hide them. And we'll also have the complications in our communication with uh, IMF um, and with other European partners about the uh, even the possibility to stop uh, the uh, visa free um, traveling. I would like uh, to uh, thank to um, uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, for the systematic uh, support uh, of the anti-corruption structure and to guarantee that uh, uh, we will do everything possible on our uh, side, that your su support will not go in vain. And we will try uh, to uh, solve the issues of which the constitutional court, but its uh, ruling uh, put at stake. This ruling of the constitutional court uh, is uh, just showing how effective the anti-corruption system is. So uh, all, all the time we are asked, uh, you are the co-authors uh, of uh, this uh, system. And we are answering uh, that we can show the numbers, uh, how much money were not uh, uh, taken away. Uh, and if you read the reports, you will understand uh, the efficiency and also uh, we can count the number of attacks and enemies and so the bigger number of them shows the higher efficiency of this system so uh, we will do everything possible to minimize uh, the consequences of uh, this court ruling at least uh, everything what we can do uh, what is in our efforts uh, so um, we should live within this ruling and we have to act accordingly thank you yaroslav how would you assess in percentage uh, that uh, the parliament uh, will succeed to 
uh, adopt the necessary amendments to the legislation. So uh, uh, the representatives of the majority uh, and the European solidarity uh, but Kivshina uh, promised uh, to work together in this area, so I hope that we will have uh, around 60% of guarantees. But if we look uh, how actively we can work, but we lost uh, two weeks. So we, uh, we are still discussing what to do. We are not yet at this stage of uh, uh, what we should vote for. So if we have this will, uh, we have uh, 50 percent, but with the pace, uh, it's less than 50 percent. Officially, the lockdown, uh, a number uh, of other aspects such as budget, collaboration with, uh, uh, with the Maltese order, that's what we are voting for without uh, uh, doing uh, instead of uh, voting for these uh, uh, amendments. So uh, mainly the vested interest is the, the key issue why they are not voting. So if we won't do this till the end of the year, uh, then the Nabu will not have the possibility to, to act till uh, 2022. And I understand that being a, a co-author of uh, this uh, system, and I understand uh, that losing the visa-free or even uh, worse uh, consequences and losing the microfinancial uh, uh, projects uh, are much more important. Uh, so we will see. Uh, we, we believe that uh, the, uh, those corrupt officials should be brought to labor or some personal uh, interest uh, that I do not want to explain what is in my ideal declaration. So I hope that the um, uh, interest of the society will win uh, over the uh, vested interest or personal interest and I, i'm very thankful to the international community uh, which reacted uh, very uh, quickly to this ruling and it makes uh, this issue very topical uh, because after uh, the um, introduction of the uh, lockdown for a weekend uh, which became the main focus topic um, and that's why the assistance uh, of the international uh, partners we can still have this topic in focus of the media and uh, the european community uh, has a very important stance and the imf and all the investment uh, uh, authorities that the European uh, Reconstruction Bank also have a very important stance. Uh, thanks, Yaroslav. Uh, the, the community, we understand uh, uh, your message that we should be proactive and we should not forget about this agenda. Artem, question to you. Uh, while reading this uh, brief, uh, which was prepared by the society seven years ago by the NGO, uh, it was foreseen uh, uh, what can happen with uh, Nebu. So uh, they, uh, it was mentioned that the necessary legislation should have been adopted. So uh, how are we going to live further with uh, this counteraction? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and for the possibility to comment on what is going on. We are speaking about the anti-corruption reform and uh, it's uh, a bit always sad to speak about uh, this topic. And I agree with uh, Yaroslav that maybe uh, some uh, um, element of uh, evaluation of our um, efforts is uh, also reflected in the number of uh, attacks. And also those attacks on the uh, head uh, of uh, the um, institution. So the first visit uh, after uh, I was uh, appointed uh, and uh, we uh, came uh, to uh, Romania and they had a similar situation uh, that uh, um, after they were appointed, there was the decision, uh, the ruling of the Constitutional Court. And we are now facing this similar situation. Uh, and uh, I would not uh, uh, want, I, I don't want uh, to um, define this ruling as a separate one because uh, we already had a similar um, attacks and uh, all those uh, rulings are against us. Uh, 
So uh, they, uh, those rulings uh, are linked uh, to specific vested interests. So if we're speaking uh, about uh, fraudulent enrichment, uh, for example, uh, there was a case of the head of the district court who was influencing uh, the justices of the constitutional court. So uh, uh, his uh, private interest uh, was uh, uh, his uh, uh, influence uh, um, uh, made uh, the justices uh, um, take the wrong uh, ruling. And then we had uh, with um, Okunraf Dagad the uh, case, uh, then uh, there was also a pressure uh, against uh, the court. Then the Constitutional uh, Court uh, also had a, a ruling uh, which uh, didn't allow us uh, to appeal against some uh, financial uh, reasons. So all the time the financial groups are uh, making great pressure um, on the court. So uh, there were also attempts in the parliament, but they failed. Uh, and uh, in the constitutional court, they succeeded. And it uh, has nothing to do with the legal practice, with the case law. The last uh, ruling uh, shows the, the um, just clash of uh, private interests. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, the ruling was written in half or even in full outside the constitutional court. So the practice of the constitutional court uh, was uh, always uh, finishing the proceeding uh, when it appeared uh, that the claim is against some uh, private steps of an individual. So um, for us, uh, it's evident uh, that this uh, ruling is a purely political one. Uh, just uh, there are some clients who have uh, asked uh, for this ruling. Uh, on the 16th of December, uh, there are uh, three uh, months uh, which were given by the Constitutional Court. Um, and I believe uh, that on the 16th uh, uh, December, nothing will uh, happen. And, uh, and we will work as we used to work, uh, but there were some issues. Uh, but uh, the uh, constitutional uh, court uh, take away the right of the president to appoint uh, the head uh, of those anti-corruption institutions. And uh, uh, in uh, May, uh, we will not have uh, the possibility uh, to elect uh, the council uh, of the uh, democratic uh, control and it's very important because uh, of this uh, public uh, council members are also delegated um, uh, to the uh, commission on uh, the behavior and also um, uh, we had the ending of uh, convocation of the head uh, of the um, anti-corruption uh, bureau so we will have those issues that's why it's very important uh, for the parliament to be consolidated and the office of the president should be also uh, focused uh, on uh, finding the solution so if there will be a political will then i believe that uh, so those issues could be solved. But to wrap up, I would like to say the biggest risk uh, to my mind is that despite the ruling uh, is a devastating one and uh, and the first uh, ruling of the anti-corruption court uh, was uh, for the fraudulent declaration. And now this ruling uh, is uh, uh, now uh, considered as uh, illegal. So this issue of the, uh, the family declaration is um, a, a very fast uh, to investigate, and we are quite uh, efficient in this. I'm very anxious uh, about uh, one issue. Uh, for me, uh, that uh, uh, anti-corruption court um, are giving the is giving the ruling uh, that. Uh, um, people should be uh, arrested. And in fact, uh, that's uh, the uh, 
a reason or why uh, they uh, they were so afraid and had such a much pressure. And when the parliament is trying to uh, solve those issues, and if uh, we uh, just eliminate the institutional court, it will not be possible uh, to uh, recover from uh, this uh, strike even in five or seven years. Now we have a functionable system, but the uh, last blow which could be uh, given to us uh, is the elimination of the anti-corruption court. And uh, then uh, we believe that in a middle uh, term perspective, we cannot uh, uh, recover from this. All those uh, opponents of Nabu are all the time saying that they are not efficient, that they are not acting. And you are saying that 1.5 billion of grievances were recovered by Nabu. And uh, the uh, if costs spent of, for uh, the uh, functioning of the uh, anti-corruption institution is less than a billion. If you have positive circumstances, can you achieve more? You do. I don't believe in some good conditions in the, in the next 10 years. Moreover, I can argue that there are very few countries or, or where such uh, agencies would, would work in some uh, good conditions. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that no law enforcement agency in developed countries doesn't uh, uh, pay back the money used to support it. And if, if we look at the figures um, that we have in our report, we are working now. There are two major, major methods of uh, bringing back the money, either voluntarily, the voluntary reimbursement of damages, and uh, such as the Ukraine after a case when 600 million grivna was um, uh, reimbursed. And another novelty is the uh, reimbursement of collateral uh, to the budget, where over 60 million grivenas has been reimbursed. Uh, and thirdly, uh, uh, is one of the fresh examples of the, the, new, the new management of a chemical company, OGCK, uh, where a, a number of investigations were launched into their case uh, because they had the embezzled the funds. Uh, but the next, uh, um, if we maintain the anti-corruption court, if they keep up with the pace of work, uh, uh, the biggest uh, revenues uh, uh, into the budget will be thanks to the sentences that will be imposed. Uh, if we find the funds in Ukraine and outside, um, that will be uh, the way we can reimburse. The, but the very main uh, method of uh, uh, bringing back the funds is based on the court sentences. These sentences have uh, finally emerged, uh, sentences uh, associated with corruption acts. Um, and not only do we have to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, the uh, prison sentences, but also we have to make sure that the funds uh, are brought back. Yeah, let us hope so. And I'd like to give the floor to Alexander Novikov. Alexander, your appointment evoked a lot of optimism uh, among anti-corruption uh, providers, and we uh, all hoped for uh, transparency and independence. But uh, this appointment cut off the wings of uh, uh, National uh, Agency for Prevention of Corruption. Do you think you will be uh, reorienting your work or you will be focused on the sectoral prevention of corruption or other way, otherwise? Certainly. Uh, thank you for your invitation. A substantial part of uh, the Nazaka powers um, have now been assigned and hopefully the parliament is going to re-establish the liability for the declaration of properties and will uh, resume the liability for anti-corruption offenses. We have to understand that um, uh, a, a casual official of the, of the ministry is uh, liable for corruption uh, or uh, administrative offense, but members of parliament or ministers do not bear such liability do not bear such a responsibility. 
which uh, completely ruins uh, uh, these demands. Um, so the lack, the failure to solve this problem creates a great legal uncertainty, uh, the lack of responsibility, which enables them to commit uh, corruption offenses, the, the top officials. Uh, secondly, we hope that the problem uh, to uh, resume the powers of Nazaka, um, and that will take place. Uh, we can't even accept statements of corruption if someone uh, wants to file a report uh, on a corruption uh, offense or a corruption case. So we hope that uh, that the constitutional court uh, will um, decisions to uh, approve the strategy. Uh, um, would also help us understand where this state is moving. Uh, and the strategy which was um, approved by the parliament back in 2017 um, doesn't allow us to make sure that every agency, including the courts and the constitutional court, uh, follow these standards of anti-corruption. For now, we hope that all these issues will be solved by the, by the parliament because without the solution, we can't prevent corruption. We still have powers of the anti-corruption examination. We still have powers of uh, to uh, draft an anti-corruption strategy. And uh, we are very limited in terms of working with whistleblowers. However, the full-fledged prevention of corruption, which is the implementation of the anti-corruption strategy, is limited is basically uh, something that is going to save us up to 200 million of grivenness annually. And that's more optimistic than what Mr. Artem has said. When will finally the anti-corruption um, uh, agencies have these um, uh, good conditions or the right conditions? I hope that in 2024, when the anti-corruption strategy is over, we will have those results. For instance, why are the declarations, the statements important? Because it's a great uh, anti-corruption uh, measure because it doesn't make sense to uh, acquire uh, the property if you are not able to use it. And uh, this is how we work. And, uh, and uh, any option, uh, whether the, the option proposed by the president or the functioning of the working group um, will be appropriate to uh, resume uh, the uh, system. I hope that everyone who is watching this conference have to understand that the ball of solving all the problems is on the field of the parliament. And if we don't have uh, the visa-free regime, which is the worst scenario, the fault is again on the parliament. So, Vitali, what about the uh, prevention of corruption? Because the, the constitutional court also uh, established their functions as non constitutional, the authorized persons uh, on prevention of corruption. So, can they exercise their functions now? This is another uh, strange aspect uh, in the decisions of the constitutional court uh, because uh, even I don't know why they have abolished that provision, but if we look at part one of Article 112 uh, on prevention of corruption, it is envisaged that it's the National Agency for Prevention of Corruption that establishes uh, the procedure of uh, their uh, work. And in this order, there are all the functions and these divisions and the powers remain to be in the same scope. And they can operate without any interruption. But if uh, uh, the senior specialist has signs of the conflict of interests, uh, he will be held liable. If a manager or of the regional level has some signs of um, offenses or corruption. You cannot really do that. You cannot hold him uh, liable. That's, it's always like this. Anyone who is lower 
in position will be held liable. Anyone who is higher in position will be immune. Yeah, for the executive branch, that's uh, uh, a problem. But uh, when it comes to the courts, when it comes to the prosecutors, uh, um, again, this is a pressing issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ola, uh, the question is to you. Everything that is happening in Ukraine now, uh, how does the international community view it? I have heard my friends once, uh, no, not non-Ukrainians, and, uh, and I think that they see the situation more optimistically than we view our situation. What is your opinion about the anti-corruption reform? Is it active enough? What do you think? Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Madam uh, Moderator, for your question. And, and uh, let me start out by thanking uh, the Ambassador uh, of Lithuania and the RPR for inviting me on this uh, very strong panel. I'm honored to be uh, among you as the only uh, non-Ukrainian. Um, and I take it as a recognition of uh, the role that Denmark is playing in the, uh, uh, as an implementing partner of, uh, for the EU anti-corruption uh, uh, program uh, and a major donor for anti-corruption efforts in uh, Ukraine. So this is indeed uh, something that has the interest not only in Denmark, but in many, many other countries. But for us, actually, anti-corruption uh, is the, um, the, 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 uh, the flagship, the, the major component of our neighborhood uh, uh, program. It's by far the biggest uh, thing that we are investing in in, in Ukraine. And of course, eradicating uh, corruption is good for uh, Ukraine and for Ukrainians, but why is anti-corruption also important for us? Uh, um, and I can tell you, um, and I think that that applies to uh, many of your friends. Uh, um, Denmark is one of uh, Ukraine's closest friends in Europe and a strong supporter of your sovereignty and, and independence. And I can tell you, it's much easier to be your friend and your supporter if things are going well in the field of anti-corruption, it's much easier. And, and moreover, and, and maybe you don't think of that, but a low level of corruption here makes it also easy to attract uh, investors here. And this is what we want to do. They, that's something they focus on. So we're not only doing this for you, we're also doing it for you, of course, but, but we also have our own self-interest. Uh, but basically your reform process is also our reform process. So if you don't succeed, we don't succeed. We need to succeed together. Um, now, looking back, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the conference we have today is just kind of run up to the, uh, the uh, conference that was held in Lithuania in 2021, and, and, and we hosted in our capital, Copenhagen, the reform conference back in 2018. And I still remember because there was a lot of optimism at that time, uh, also when it comes to anti-corruption. And why is that? Because at that time, you saw this development of the anti-corruption architecture. You had institutions being built and uh, and it all looked very well and and uh, i think at that time the high anti-corruption court was uh, established and and this created the kind of uh, the hope that that you would kind of close the the circle that all the institutions that uh, are needed would be in place and then we have seen this steady improvement uh, of, of things and um, um corrupt officials are now actually being sentenced and heard about that uh, and some of them are being uh, are being sent to prison um um, today, however, and this is uh, what, what you mentioned uh, already, uh, the anti-corruption architecture are facing a, a lot of uh, pressure. And, and uh, this question is also being asked abroad, and it's being asked in, in Denmark. And the, 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 the prime reason that I see is that the institution that you represent were actually successful. You actually achieved a lot. Now you start to bite. And now this is being felt. And, and now vested interest, uh, this is also what we heard, are, being, are fighting back. They want to roll back the achievements that have been, uh, been uh, achieved so far, uh, and they must not succeed. I think that's absolutely uh, crucial. And, and this decision by the Constitutional Court of the 27th of October, it has really far-reaching and devastating uh, consequences uh, for the whole anti-corruption infrastructure. And I, I know the complexity of the, the situation, um, and, and, but I appreciate also the urgency with which uh, uh, lawmakers, uh, with uh, which uh, the president and the government has, uh, has tackled this. Uh, and I think it's uh, very important to keep the momentum and for the parliament to act. And I'm glad that we have a lawmaker on the panel today. And uh, I, I feel very confident after what you said that, that this is something that is being addressed. So I think seen from abroad, Ukraine is really now at a dramatic turning point uh, and, and the steps that, that Ukraine and its uh, uh, political institutions will take 
in the days and the weeks to come, they will be very, very decisive. They will determine the future of your reform process and thereby also the future of Ukraine. So it, it's really big things at play at, uh, at this point in time. Now, the good news is that there's still time to do something. And uh, I think we all know what is, uh, uh, what is uh, necessary. First of all, of course, restore the e -de declaration system and the powers of the NACP as soon as possible and reinstate criminal liability for false declarations. I think that's the most important thing. And then the legal status of NABU uh, has to be uh, uh, fixed uh, before the 16th of December, ensuring its uh, independence. That's absolutely crucial as well. And the new head of SAPO must be selected in a transparent and merit-based uh, way. Um, and finally, the independence and the functions of the high anti-corruption court uh, must be protected. These are pretty basic uh, things, and, and it's not rocket science. We all know that these are uh, uh, the things that need to be done. But these um, actions can only be taken by Ukraine's own political institution. We cannot take them. We are we're not allowed to uh, to uh, meddle into the uh, the, the um, internal affairs of the uh, host nation, and we shouldn't. This is something for Ukraine and Ukrainians to to fix. Um, and Ukraine should not take these measures uh, just to ensure um, uh, continued financial support. You should do it because uh, these measures are absolutely crucial for the continuation of the. Um, transformation and reform process that you embarked upon in 2014. So it's in your own interest as well. And I can tell you that Denmark as your close friend and partner will, will be ready to, uh, to support you in that uh, process. And I'm pretty confident that when this um, Ukraine reform process uh, conference will uh, convene, that's gonna happen sometime in 2021 in, in Lithuania, um, then people will participate. They will look back at these dramatic days and weeks uh, in Ukraine, and then they will say, Ukraine did the right thing. They did fix uh, the problem. So um, I'm still optimistic, as you said, and maybe I'm a bit more optimistic than Ukrainians, but I haven't been here that long, and I'm very happy to be here, by the way. Thank you for uh, inviting me once again. I'm very pleased. And continue the good work that you are doing. I know that you, in combination, represent the uh, driving force of the fight against corruption in Ukraine. I'm proud to be on this panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for believing in Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much for believing in Ukraine, uh, for our capability to uh, fight against these problems. This encourages us a lot. Uh, we are moving forward. Uh, Serhii, the, uh, the question is to you. First of all, I'd like to ask you, uh, if you speak candidly, are the civil servants happy uh, that uh, uh, the uh, liability for uh, true uh, declarations uh, has been abolished? I can say for 300% that this situation hasn't made any of the civil servants happy because over this time, while the e-declaration system functioned, and prior to that, the principles of integrity and responsibility to the society, the key uh, grounds on which uh, civil service operated, uh, uh, were uh, met, I would like to stabilize the situation and to bring back the functions of um, NACP. And in terms of the uh, anti-corruption examination, uh, the regulations uh, have been developed by the cabinet of ministers. And next week, hopefully, or later, the, that bill will be voted on and NACP will be one of the agencies that will have the right to draft the acts and in terms of other initiatives briefly uh, the provisions um, of the state anti-corruption policy have been prepared the uh, criteria and the methodology of the assessment of um, uh, um, uh, NACP performance uh, have been prepared. Uh, the commission will be created to uh, uh, select the AMA and uh, 
uh, hopefully that will be finalized. There are a lot of anti-corruption initiatives and our sectoral ministry is working on that, the, the, to digitize all the processes, to re reduce the human factor impact, um, to facilitate the provision uh, of government services. Uh, the DABI reform, there is e maliatko or e-baby procedure has been uh, facilitated also. Hopefully we'll have um, uh, e-sick leaves, uh, introduced soon. The verification of all the databases uh, and registries uh, is taking place uh, where the maximum of services will be uh, become electronic. In my opinion, that's the most active method of uh, fighting corruption, where you have a clear uh, procedure, clear deadlines, minimum human impact. I think we're working on that. And one of the key partners of ours in implementing these activities is Together Against Corruption initiative, which since 2016 has existed. And uh, we've completed a lot of anti-corruption uh, measures. Currently an instruction was done by the ministry to uh, resume some of the measures and in about a month or two, uh, we will consolidate all the data and we will be jointly monitoring it by the government and hopefully by the public. Thank you, Serhi. I'd like to point out on my behalf that Serhi is the person at the Cabinet of Ministers who always comes to reach out to the public and always helps the public. Uh, oftentimes, it's impossible to deliver your message, and it's important to have a partner. Um, there's a sense of partnership from the power. Uh, so thank you very much for all of your assistance. Finally, we'll be talking to Mikola. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I know that uh, you have an idea on what should the anti-corruption priorities look like. Um, and I think your opinion is slightly different from we from what we have in the brief. Uh, thank you, Oksano. I have prepared the slides because I have some numbers, have some figures. Uh, I would like for you to see them. I've made a statistical selection on the three most popular crimes among the uh, uh, corruption criminals. Uh, the uh, uh, theft of property, obtaining bribes, and abuse of power. You see that uh, in almost 10 years, the, the, the crime rate has reduced substantially on uh, uh, Article 1 about 12 times, on number 2 and 5.5 times, and number 3, the abuse of power has decreased by 354 times. You see how many people were sentenced for such crimes, and there are some legal expl explanations of that and political explanations of that. However, the percentage of people who were acquitted for such crimes has increased dramatically, which is more than 8%. Although, all in all, the courts acquit not more than 0.3% of individuals. Now, in terms of the prison sentences, it's very unlikely and happens very rarely. Um, so, so after uh, the situation with uh, uh, Judge Zvaric, who uh, got a real prison sentence, we normally have either a penalty, a fine, which is imposed, or the criminal case is uh, closed down, uh, or a suspended sentence is Im imposed. Uh, it's interesting that the number of uh, criminal uh, proceedings is not reducing. It's about the same at the same level but the number of sentences is reducing substantially. We see here 
four by 47 times less uh, of uh, the people sentenced than the number of criminal proceedings uh, with an indictment filed with the court. So we have 47 uh, suspects, as you see here, the average, yeah, uh, which isn't very common. And we don't know where these suspects appear between the prosecution office and the court. They're supposed to be sentenced, but where are they? Um, and uh, the SAPO activity filed 69 criminal um, uh, proceedings, and there are 33 sentences. And if we look at all the investigators, prosecutors who investigated into different types of crimes in Ukraine, and the number of those cases that made their way to the courts, the sentences uh, uh, only 0.03% of those sentences uh, actually made their way to the court. So that the system doesn't really work. And also, let's look at the positions of the suspects sentenced. I think we have to review the list in Article 216 of the Criminal and Procedural code. So the fight against corruption is a profanation. The number of sentenced or acquitted uh, doesn't really impact the condition of corruption or the state of corruption. How can we justify the work of NABU and, SA and uh, SAPO uh, is a big question, but we have to think about the audit of the work of these agencies and how can we increase their in efficiency? Because even the, in terms of the number of cases that were sent to the court in the four years, not every detective, a detective had a chance of sending his case to the court. In terms of the brief and recommendations, in my opinion, it, the brief doesn't meet the challenges that we are facing today. The parliament has to pass 12 laws, including those on the improvement of the institutions. The Ministry of Justice has to do something with the verification and so on and so forth. Based on this brief, we see that we are like travelers that seemingly have to keep walking, but we are standing uh, on the spot and uh, shaking the dogs away from its feet. Uh, if we look at the um, uh, UN Convention Against Corruption, I think it must be the basic convention that we should follow. And anything that is being done in this country is either inefficient or inappropriate or is absent. The key provisions of the convention, the UN, of the UN Convention, are shown here, the slide one, slide two, and slide three. And everywhere do we see major problems and we don't see any good points. We have problems, uh, some of the problems are horrible. Uh, there's also a problem that all of this must be done simultaneously. And as the brief states, we can't do something and not do the other. Uh, where you can't uh, install a wooden bar in a fence and wouldn't uh, install a second bar in the fence because the fence would fall down. So that must be implemented through a government program and we'll have to replace all these bars at the same time. And I believe that that will happen someday. So in the nearest future, I need to, we should be focused on two major points. The first one is the uh, awareness campaign to focus on it and to create in the society uh, a certain number of people who will 
understand the need to fight corruption because currently people treat uh, corruption uh, just like they treat uh, uh, the evading of taxes, for instance, or the, the, the smuggling. They don't understand the danger thereof. Uh, and no anti-corruption strategy will work unless people have the right awareness. We should also perform what we call de-oligarchization. Um, and uh, uh, if we take uh, the TV broadcasting uh, as a monopoly uh, by the oligarchs, then uh, we have a very devastating situation. That's why we have to move step by step, uh, which is seen on this slide. First, uh, it's uh, the ban for the, the uh, financing of political uh, advertising. Then we should demonopolize of the economy. Uh, and uh, the oligarchs shouldn't uh, perceive uh, the attacks against them as personal attacks. That's why we should support the uh, medium and small uh, business. And uh, then, uh, step by step, uh, they will grow and uh, will uh, oligarchs will have less um, room for uh, them in the economy. We uh, were speaking less uh, about uh, the anti-corruption institution, but also to work in other directions uh, to minimize the influence of the monopolies. And uh, secondly, uh, number C, demonization of the oligarchs. Uh, if we will be speaking about the anti-monopoly committee, uh, which should be independent, then I will perceive that we are at a further stage. Nabu should be strengthened, but uh, we uh, should also change uh, the sum of the damage. And Nabu should not be uh, dealing uh, with some uh, small uh, offenders, uh, but with uh, top corruption. And we should remember that uh, we have not only uh, corruption um, uh, crimes, but also the uh, taxes, uh, uh, crimes connected with taxes. Thanks a lot. Mikola, thank you for such an alternative uh, point of view. I fully agree with uh, your uh, points. Where should the priorities be? Thank you. And uh, we will be happy to listen to Andrei Borovic. Do you agree with uh, what Mr. Mikola stated? What's your vision of the priorities of the anti-corruption reform? In which uh, direction it should be um, made? First of all, thanks for the invitation. I would like to start with a date. Today, the fee uh, reminded me that it was a last date uh, of uh, the, the um, submitting uh, competition uh, to the um, NASP. And uh, if uh, in Romania uh, there was the ruling uh, of the Constitutional Court, here we had uh, our enemies uh, who appeared uh, to be more clever. Uh, they gave uh, the possibility uh, to work for several years uh, and only after that uh, they made this uh, step so at that time it looked uh, everything looked uh, much more positive than now but at the same time let's be uh, frank the anti-corruption structure in ukraine in the way we have created uh, worked only for nine months at some uh, point, uh, we have the anti-corruption court for only one uh, year. The uh, NASP worked only uh, for nine months. That's why when the critics are saying that we have spent uh, a lot of uh, money for the anti-corruption infrastructure, it's true. Uh, 
uh, but uh, the task of uh, these agencies not to bring money uh, to the state, uh, but uh, to fight with the corruption and moving to the next uh, stage, which Mikhail Ivanovich mentioned, uh, when we will speak about the anti-monopoly community and so on. But for the last five or six years, we are just uh, not moving forward, uh, but uh, uh, marching on the, the same place. So all the uh, anti-corruption institutions have uh, issues. Now, ARMA, uh, does not uh, have the head for more than a year, uh, so the parliament cannot decide how it uh, should be um, appointed. And in uh, SEPO, knows um, uh, are not uh, do not meet the criteria set in the law. Uh, the anti-corruption uh, court um, uh, has started its uh, functioning, and now uh, it closes uh, all the claims and so on. And I will not speak about NASP because everyone has already mentioned about it. And it will be happening like this until uh, it is uh, solved. So when those uh, agencies will uh, have the possibility to work only on their tasks, uh, and uh, I do not know when this time happens, and we have uh, a lot uh, to do a lot of steps and also to have a political will. I think that we can say uh, that there is no political will in our country. The Constitutional Court uh, of Ukraine showed another issue uh, which uh, was hidden. Sometimes media is paying attention to this. So when the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council is saying uh, uh, that the ruling of uh, the uh, court was influenced uh, by the Russian Federation. Then I have a question where the civil, uh, the state security uh, service of Ukraine was, uh, why they didn't protect uh, this. That's why this ruling of the constitutional court is showing much more issues. And even uh, in the judiciary system, uh, there is a group of people who are willing to get back to uh, 2010 uh, when everyone was living uh, in good conditions. So uh, I believe that we have to solve all the issues step by step. And the first one, the priority should be uh, some active steps, uh, for example, uh, working uh, group uh, was established in the parliament and it took uh, three weeks. So the first step is uh, um, uh, to br uh, bring back the criminal liability. And uh, secondly, uh, the uh, activities of the NASP. So if the anti-corruption infrastructure was not functionable or effective, were we wouldn't have uh, that many attacks uh, and uh, enemies. And uh, people could uh, have uh, solved their private interests uh, with uh, the anti-corruption uh, institutions, but they failed to do this. So now uh, they are trying uh, to the bribes uh, in different agencies. So. Now, if we start speaking uh, about something positive, the anti-corruption uh, legislation uh, was adopted, uh, the law on procurement, and uh, then uh, the uh, law on the lease uh, and uh, of um, state uh, assets, which allows to use the state assets in better way. It would be great if uh, the uh, new modernized, uh, digitalized uh, methods of uh, audit uh, would be introduced because I think that now we do not know what belongs to the state and in what condition uh, it is. I think uh, that uh, uh, the business and even private people would uh, find a lot of assets if we give them the possibility uh, to get into those registers. So if we will bring back uh, the 
um, powers to the NASP and also bring uh, criminal uh, liability um, back, then we will solve uh, greater issues. And after that, we can move uh, to the next uh, issues. Thank you, Andrew, for naming the priorities. We have Darina Kalinyuk, who is ready to join us online. And uh, uh, please, colleagues, uh, uh, join us with Darina. So the Center for um, uh, Anti-Corruption Center, uh, you are acting as a watchdog. So how can we activate watchdog uh, to make the parliament uh, act Thank more quickly because the, it took them three weeks to create a working group. I will answer uh, this question later, but first I would like um, to look at the situation from a uh, different angle. We shouldn't forget that Ukraine is in the, the state of war with the Russian Federation. We shouldn't forget that war is open. And it's an armed conflict, and it's also uh, a high warfare. And the decision of the uh, constitutional uh, court uh, is not uh, just uh, a strange step. Uh, and it's not uh, strange that it happened uh, after the local elections and also the, after the elections of the U.S. And now uh, in the U.S. we have uh, the transition period uh, from uh, one uh, power uh, to another. Uh, That's why this unprecedented step uh, was taken in this specific time. time. And so, uh, so when we are drawing those apocalyptic pictures uh, of fighting uh, uh, in Ukraine, we should remember uh, that uh, we have both internal and external stakeholders and uh, those who are interested. So it's not the uh, ruling against uh, the anti-corruption agents. The ruling uh, against some oligarchs, uh, for the sake of some oligarchs. It was one uh, of the several planned steps to undermine uh, the collaboration of Ukraine with our uh, foreign international partners. It's not by chance uh, that the land and bank uh, reform uh, should have been uh, voted uh, in the parliament. Uh, after this ruling of the court on the uh, in declaration, I believe that the Constitutional Court is speaking in a calm way that his mother-in-law is living in Donetsk and that he is not afraid that something happens uh, with her. And uh, his, uh, uh, for example, um, real estate state uh, is in Crimea and uh, he is not uh, declaring this. Uh, in Ukraine, we have a chance to uh, in fighting corruption. And there are high chances that we will succeed. And, and uh, we are succeeding in those efforts. We have uh, those attacks, uh, those hybrid attacks from uh, internal and external forces. It looks like a blitz That's why I believe that the main task of the parliament is the blocking of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine to stop uh, the possibility of uh, ruining uh, other reforms which will influence our relations uh, with the, the IMF and EU on the 8th of uh, December. Uh, there will be the assembly uh, of uh, the judges who will uh, elect the uh, Constitutional Court. The the judge. Judge. So on the 9th or 10th uh, of uh, December, we can have some unprecedented rulings from the Constitutional Court, which could really affect Ukraine. And the Parliament has not started yet uh, reading of any of the legislation. 
просто для цілей самозбереження держави України і її незалежності. Не для цілей боротьби з корупцією, а для цілей збереження проєвропейського і євроатлантичного напрямку України. Друге рішення, яке має зробити парламент і президент в тому числі, це повернути брехню в деклараціях в Кримінальний кодекс. Ярослав говорив вже про це, я повністю погоджуюсь, що нам потрібно відновити хоча б превентивну функцію реєстру декларацій. Олександр, здається, Новіков казав, що саме функціонування реєстру, публічного реєстру, є важливим стимуючим фактором. Так, вироків небагато. Але сама перспектива отримати кримінальне покарання за недостовірні відомості в декларація змушує публічних осіб декларувати свої статки більш-менш відповідності до реальності. Віктор Медведчук виключно із-за цього задекларував 98 компаній з яких 44 на Кіпрі, 4 чи 5 в Болгарії, 2 в Британії, до того, до декларування. Журналісти, розслідувачі збирали по краплинкам інформацію про ці компанії. Зараз є набагато більше інструментів виявляти корупцію у журналістів-розслідувачів і у громадських очках активістів. Якщо до кінця грудня не буде повернути відповідальність кримінальність за декларування парламенту, то за 2020 рік ми отримуємо купу декларацій з достовірних відомостей. І ми нічого не зможемо зробити, як держава для того, щоб покарати за цю прихідність. Третє, що потрібно зробити, і це також відповідальність і президента, і парламенту. Нарешті зрушити судову реформу, яка є основою співпраці з нашими міжнародними партнерами. Це формат Міжнародного валютного фонду, європейським союзом. Зараз, я розумію, тривають переговори з Міжнародним валютним фондом. Був дзвінок, була розмова президента Зеленського з директором розпорядником Міжнародного валютного фонду Кристаліною Георгією. Одним з структурних маяків співпраці між Україною та Міжнародним валютним фондом є перезапуск Вищої Ради правосуддя та початок комплексної судової реформи. Президент публічно вже сказав, він навіть написав в Financial Times, чи в Нью-Йорк, якщо не пам'ятаю, в поважне міжнародне видання, що він вважає пріоритетом для себе комплексну судову реформу. Нарешті він це заявив, тепер час діяти, причому діяти дуже швидко. Я очікую, що в результаті переговорів між владою українською та міжнародними партнерами, зокрема міжнародним валютним фондом, народиться законопроект, він буде поданий в парламент, чи урядом, чи президентом, і цей законопроект передбачатиме реальну судову реформу. А парламент швидко знайде політичну волю, щоб проголосувати за цей законопроект. Це ці три кроки спроможні відновити довіру між Україною та нашими міжнародними партнерами. І ці три кроки спроможні попередити подальший демонтаж ключових реформ в Україні як Конституційного суду. І ці три кроки можуть відновити хоча б частково ті втрати, які Конституційний суд завдав своїм рішенням про фактично демонтаж електронного декларування. Їх потрібно робити швидко, їх потрібно робити консолідовано. Має бути якась взаємодія між президентом і парламентом, між різними фракціями парламенту, між громадянським суспільством і міжнародними партнерами. Зараз на кону дуже високі ставки. Якщо Україна не відновить співпрацю з міжнародними партнерами, не отримає фінансування від МВФ, від Європейського Союзу, макрофінансову допомогу, то ми опинимося в надзвичайно скрутній економічній ситуації. Вона спричинена ковідом, 
Of вона спричинена величезними помилками влади в реформі. Але без міжнародної фінансової допомоги нас, як країна, чекає надзвичайно складна зима. Ситуація з ковідом також ну, дуже така наближена до катастрофічної. Наша влада провела спроможність підготувати країну до спалого коронавірусу. Ми шість місяців витрачали гроші на дороги, а не на підготовку клінік. І зараз немає можливостей, як стрекомувати епідемію і як рятувати людей. Тобто, ну, вже багато хто пише, що єдиним способом може бути локдаун. Локдаун – це удар по економіці, нижчевний удар по економіці. Без допомоги міжнародних партнерів, ми його не витримали. Тому зараз для цілі збереження життів людей, для попередження ескалації ситуації всередині держави, парламенту і президенту потрібно зібрати всю волю в кулак і поремонтувати декларування, заблокувати Конституційний суд, зробити рішучі кроки для судової реформи. Це відновить співпрацю України з міжнародними партнерами. Попередить нищівні удари на напрямку євроатлантичної співпраці, євроатлантичного розвитку України. Якщо цього не буде зроблено, то якщо депутат, якщо президент зараз не зроблять протягом грудня ці рішення, то вони будуть причиною критичного розвороту Україну в сторону Кремля. Я зараз говорю не з позиції протидії корупції, я говорю з позиції євроатлантичного напрямку розвитку. Він зараз підзаходить. Наш двор Російська Федерація через гібридні методи намагається зруйнувати ключові підвалини співпраці України з Заходом. Їм це поки що вдається. Нам потрібно знайти єдність і рішучі дії для того, щоб попередити критичний розворот України в напрямку Я сподіваюся, що нам все так. Дякую. How the public sector, the NGOs, can assist the parliament and the president to take the decisions. I believe that the public sector is doing everything possible and even impossible. We have prepared. Спільно з багатьма експертними організаціями всі експертні сценарії можливого виходу з криз. Тобто, як заблокувати Конституційний суд з найменшими втратами. Ми скомунікували ці сценарії з різними людьми в парламенті, в Офісі Президента, з міжнародними партнерами, з медіа. Я не знаю, що ми ще можемо зробити. Я думаю, що якщо президент і парламент або хоча б окремі сили в парламент, скажуть, ми готові рятувати країну, то незважаючи на нашу критику, незважаючи на те, що вони самі винні, і президент, і парламент, в тому, що ми дожили за такої ситуації, нам потрібно підтримати і президент, і парламент. Ось така в мене бачення. Дякую дуже, Дарина. For this wide framework and for showing those topical pressing issues, thanks to all the colleagues for your opinions, for showing the strategic direction where we should move forward, and that we should look at the efficiency of the anti-corruption institutions and also to implement the sector reforms, but also the steps, practical steps, which should be taken right now. So this is the adoption of the legislation which can bring back the e-declaration and the criminal liability. Thank you for the discussions. We do hope that the parliament will do its task and we will see
uh, and we will be happy how Ukraine is uh, progressing on its way fighting corruption. Thank you.